we are sad to announce the death of the Labour Party, 1900 to 2021. We have Jackie Smith here for a comment. Jackie, what's your reaction to this sad news? Um, <laughs> I'm off. I'm not doing the podcast. I'm leaving in protest. Um, no, I have plenty. I will have plenty to say at the appropriate moment. OK, Ian. well, before yeah. we get to that appropriate moment, let's uh, welcome everyone to this second live edition of For The Many podcast um, from my sitting room in Tunbridge Wells and from Jackie's sitting room. Is it your sitting room? No, it it's, my really, sort of, it? it's my sort of diner. It's my yeah. kitchen diner area. And, the, and jug It's room. the Jackie Smith home, home of jugs. <laughs> now, we have a few little administrative announcements to make. Um, we don't want you to use the chat box for chat. Apart we from the bit, the people that say, your hair is great, Jackie. Jackie, you look so good. Um, all of that. That's, that's fine to say, to no, say that we, because it, it just it makes a difference. Just, just, just a minute. It makes a difference from the person on Twitter this morning after our Good Morning Britain appearance, Ian, who <laughs> said, uh, "Who said? well, in your case, who said, I don't want to be nasty, but Jackie looks dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> well, how very rude. You had God your leather trousers been, on. I did. God knows what they'd been admit, like if they'd been nasty. Well, when, when you arrived in what laughingly they call the green room, which w would fit into a sort of Romanian prison, I think, <laughs> when, when you arrived, I was thinking... Oh, she's going to change. I didn't realise you were going on Cheeky in your, in your leather, leather trousers. <laughs> I've become a little bit more loose. Don't over they get lockdown. a bit sticky though, leather trousers? Well, not if they're proper. They're not pleather, darling. It's not PVC. It's proper <laughs> leather. They're breathable. Anyway, carry on and say the yes. thing about the chat. Right. Everybody can stop telling me how nice I look now. 39 people have already uh, used the chat room. Don't use the chat room unless you want to ask a question, because that's how we're going to do this. Uh, when we've done our ramblings about uh, sort of gunboat diplomacy and our ma magnificent victory over the French and the local elections and, and whatever, um, we're going to do a lot of questions tonight. I've got a lot on uh, email that have arrived, um, but we actually want to do a lot of you on here. And that's kind of why you're here, I guess. So the one I'm really looking forward to is Joseph Moore. Because do you remember Joseph a few weeks ago on the podcast, he um, wanted some advice from Jackie and myself, and we gave conflicting advice. Uh, Joseph had uh, decided that he, or, well, he was asking, should he or should he not tell the girl, I think it was a girl of his dreams, that he sort of rather fancied her. And I said he should absolutely go for it. And I think, Jackie, you were a little bit more reticent. And anyway, um, he's going to tell us later on exactly what happened. Well, his version of what happened anyway. So I'm looking forward to that. But if you do want to ask a question, put it in the chat box. But if you want to chat, do it on Twitter under the hashtag for the many. And then you can sort of see what everybody else is thinking of what we're doing or um, whatever. Um, so that's the way that we're going to do this. And we, we will be able to see you and everybody else will be able to see you asking the question. So I hope you're all dressed up in your best bib and tucker. Um, I hope you've got some suitable imbibements to uh, help you along. And somebody you remember. Is that even say, a word? Is that is even it, a word, yeah, imbibement? So. Is it? Somebody emailed me earlier to say that they were going to be eating pigs in blankets. I'm not a great fan of pigs in blankets unless they're burnt to a cinder, which is how you would normally cook them, I guess. What were you looking behind you for? Um, because the cover of my underfloor heating just fell off of, <laughs> on its own. I, your, I assumed it was my dog, but the dog's... heating. The dog's... How middle class can that be in, <laughs> in Great Malvern? The dog's not even there and the whole thing is just fallen apart <laughs> now at the moment i don't know who you've got on the top of your screen i've got tom stevens i've got adriana pingas i've got cgt 7836 i've got mary hunt and amy jones whose podcast i did last week um amy's in the discord group if you want to join that um but i think we ought to get onto a bit of meet didn't we this is what the podcast is for we we kind of purposely timed this so it would be the evening of all the uh, local elections scottish parliament welsh assembly i've got the television on um over there which i have to put my glasses on to look at um so in wales labor have got 22 conservatives 21 others 12 presumably that's plied um 
So that's going to be quite an interesting one. Wales, Scotland, um, the SNP are clearly uh, sweeping the board. Um, English local elections. Well, Jackie, you, you tell us what's happening in the English local elections and the Hartlepool by-election. I think people deserve to know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for regular um, listeners, of course, Ian is doing what he does well for a man, which is to <laughs> multitask. And at least not only will you be able to hear him tapping away on his screen, as you quite often can, but you'll also be able to see him looking away from me at the, um, at the TV screen. So I think it would be fair to say, Ian, for those of us of a Labour disposition, that it has not been the best day. It started early You this speak morning. your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you mean it's a fucking disaster? <laughs> I think the words that Keir used or somebody used were it's it was a sh it's been a shattering blow. Um, it isn't a good it's not a good day. It started first thing this morning with the results of the Hartlepool by election, where, whilst you and I were sitting in the uh, green the green room at um, Good Morning Britain. Although it had effectively been conceded by Labour sometime before that they were going to lose. Which that is actually quite unusual, isn't it? That doesn't often happen well, um, on the media before the result. Expectations management, I think, has been happening all week. And we earlier on in the week, we had Keir Starmer saying, I'm going to take responsibility for whatever happens on the day. Well, you don't need to say that if you think everything's going to go well. So mm. I think we saw a, an element of that early on. I Even I was surprised at how big the defeat was, though, in um, Hartlepool. I mean, it was nearly 7,000 vote majority. Uh, in a seat which, as everybody points out, since it was formed in 1974, has only ever been uh, Labour. It had a small Labour majority in 2019, rather unusually, I suppose. Um, it, um, it was, oh, I've been distracted by the anonymous for the many poll. <laughs> Well, for those listening on the podcast uh, tomorrow, we've just launched a poll uh, to see how many of the 500 people who, well, around 500 people who are watching this, how they voted in the elections today. And it's neck and neck at the moment. Yeah, but let's not forget, Ian, the only poll that matters is in the ballot box. Oh, no, wait, let's do, <laughs> let's do this one instead. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> Hartlepool is not good news for Labour. Funnily enough, even before, so I'm going to say this to prevent anybody else from saying it, even before I'd seen the Hartlepool result, I woke up in my London hotel, <clears throat> um, first time away for a long time, uh, and what, checked what, what my Twitter. What room number were you in? I wonder if we were next door to I each was other. In, um, I was in 1063. Oh, I was in 1034. Uh. Yeah, I did wonder. I... I, I Thought about saying, you know, do you want to come around and try the mini bar? But one, there wasn't one. <laughs> Two, it wasn't allowed. And three, I thought, I can't be asked. I'm just going to watch the telly. <laughs> so anyway. Did you, did you watch Burko make an utter fool of himself on Question Time? I think that's a contentious comment, Ian. It was meant I, to be. I didn't watch Question Time. How was John Burko on Question Time? Well, he, I thought he was his typical oleaginous self. Um, Robert Jenrick was the Conservative Cabinet Minister on, and at, at one point, uh, and, and he got a little bit antsy with Burko at one point, so Burko just sort of shot back, because they, they, they sat quite a long way apart, and he just shot back, ah, oh, um, Robert's intervening from a sedentary position, and I thought, you utter dick. Yeah, but no, no, if you are the Speaker, that's your niche, the Speaker of the House of Commons, that's your niche, isn't it? And he wants to be remembered like that, presumably. Jackie says, sit up and pay attention, please. <laughs> see, I'm, I, as I'm Jackie speaking, says, I'm flicking through all of your, so I can see what beauty, we have some very good looking people on uh, watching us tonight, Jackie. Of course. <laughs> um, but Jackie's attention was wandering then. I'm just checking. Uh. <laughs> oh, we, we've got, we've got um, two people on one screen here. Richard Thompson and he, see so sexist he doesn't even put his wife's or girlfriend's name on there hey that's um, they're not supposed to be together Julian Steve are there Jonathan Isabee see 
maybe we should stop doing this because people listening to the podcast yeah. tomorrow are going to get bored of this, aren't they? Yeah. But I, I think it's fascinating. So anyway, shut up. I was about to make my, I was about to get the bad stuff out so that you wouldn't have to rib me about it. The most disappointing result for me in the middle of the night was the council results in Redditch, yeah. where in the end, Labour lost seven out of seven seats, including the council seat that I used to represent, which was, I have to say, pretty safe. Uh, back in those days. Um, and some Tories in Redditch are crowing about the fact that this is the first time that all the council seats have gone in one direction. Well, I can tell them that back in 1995, I think it was, or 1996, all 10 council seats in Redditch were won by Labour. So um, <clears throat> that's politics, right? The ups and the downs, the roller coaster ride. Stop. What are you taking a picture for? Why not? Is that, are you taking a picture of me having to say bad things about yeah. red? Yeah, I thought so. Um, so let's get on then to now that you can stop relishing me having to talk about bad news for Labour. Let's get on to what our conclusions of this are. And of course, we also should tell our listeners that although we will be talking about the elections, both national and local today, we will be doing another podcast yes. at the end of Sunday when we'll be able to reflect on all of the results that will have come through by then. Because, of course, we haven't had all of the results. We're beginning to see the results from Scotland and Wales, as you say. We haven't had the, the significant mayoral uh, elections result um, uh, announced yet uh, and there will be even more to talk about tomorrow evening which you'll be able to listen to on Monday morning. Because we like to give value for money don't we? Um, right well let's let's do it in a bit of order. Um, at, at the moment I mean let's start with Hartlepool because I think everyone saw it coming. Um, I, I, I never really trust um, polls in by-elections because I, I remember once um, in the 1980s, Anglia Television got UEA students to do to do a poll. I can't even remember what it was for now. It wasn't a by-election, but it was something in Norwich that they wanted to do. And I was part of the team that, that was supposed to go out and sort of get results. But it was absolutely pissing down with rain, and we frankly just made it all up. Um, <laughs> Sorry, to all my friends in the polling industry, I do think that polling has probably... <laughs> come on a bit well, I think then. it probably um, has but the, the last poll in Hartlepool I think it was only 300 people and it was a couple of weeks ago and you think well how reliable is that now as it turned out it was actually spot on and the Tories won with 52 percent of the vote now Hartlepool I think is quite an interesting area if you look at the politics of it over the last few years of course Peter Mandelson was the um, MP there and uh it was one of those seats that I think the Conservatives had hopes of winning in 2019, less so maybe in 2017, uh, but they didn't because of the Brexit party. So people can interpret this result in all sorts of different ways. But the fact is the Brexit party vote just went. Uh, the Liberal Democrat vote, I think, was about 1%. They came behind the Greens and they were only like 1.2%. So um, the Brexit party vote almost entirely went to the Conservatives. And that's really, um, I suppose, why why they won mm. Um, mm. predominantly. But you can't you can't put you can't use that reason to explain all the votes all around the country. I mean, there, there have been UKIP councils or UKIP votes where they haven't stood this time, and that that vote again has predominantly gone to the Conservatives. But I think it's too simplistic to say that it's all to do with that. I uh, the one thing I cannot really get a hold of is whether or not Brexit still has a significance to voters and I know and you've made you know you sort of challenged me on this point about Hartlepool that of course our candidate um, had a very good pedigree as a doctor always appeared you know from the vaccination centre where you he mean had a doctor been vaccinating who to close people. down the local hospital six there years ago there was an issue about his concerns around the configuration of health services here. Um, but uh, was that really, I'm not so sure that Brexit remains, uh, with the exception, as you say, of the redistribution of those votes that had previously been pro-Brexit and had gone to UKIP or to the Brexit party. I'm not so sure that's the defining issue. I think um, what is more significant possibly is uh, we have not, um, there, is, there is a feeling in some constituencies 
in lots of parts of the country, I suspect, of being um, left behind by politics and by the way in which the economy has um, developed and not feeling that Labour is representing the aspirations or the interests of their areas. And frankly, and, and, I, and this is where there is a link to Brexit, because I think there was a similar vibe in the Brexit referendum, which was to say, industrial changes mean that we feel quite alienated. Um, we aren't necessarily convinced that the Tories or Brexit would be better for us than what we've got at the moment. But actually, frankly, we're willing to throw things up into the air and give something else a go. And put that alongside um, uh, what seems to have been a sort of popular mayor in Ben Houchen, in that, a Tory mayor in that area, who does seem to have made the most of that mayoral role. And you've got, I think, a feeling that people think, well, we might as well give them a go. And the other thing that I just find really, I mean, anybody who's listened to the podcast will know I found this incomprehensible, is the popularity of Boris Johnson. And we've talked on the podcast about whether or not the wallpaper and the sleaze stuff um, was going to impact on the result of the election doesn't feel as if it has done. I still think it's a slow burner, incidentally. Um, but people have priced all of that in. They have mm. priced in to Boris Johnson that he wouldn't know the truth if it jumped up and bit him on the nose, that he is um, has a dubious moral compass, uh, that he made, in my opinion, the wrong or late decisions at the beginning of the pandemic. But people seem to go with his leadership. See, but, but in a way, you have just exemplified the problem that the Labour Party has. Oh, so, uh, do not call me metropolitan elite. Do I not. I wasn't going to. But I, I think ever since 2008, the Labour Party has underestimated Boris Johnson. They've never quite got his appeal. Um, mm. I must admit, in some ways, I've never quite got his appeal either, but I've recognised that it's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ken Livingstone consistently underestimated me, even when he fought him the second time in 2012. Uh, and I think also, um, I mean, he wasn't the greatest foreign secretary, I don't think. Um, I, I think his... Oh, understatement his, of his, the year. His, yeah. The way he behaves as prime minister, we're not used to it. But he's just got that likability factor for people. And if you're on the left, you, you don't get that. You just don't understand it. And you think that he only appeals to sort of middle class, upper class toffs uh, who've been to public school. Well, I've always said that you, you just have to follow him down the street and see what an absolute star he is. People want is, a bit of Boris. And you and I might not understand that, but we have to understand the phenomenon. Is it too much? Is it too much of a squeeze to draw this analogy with Trump that that you have this irony of somebody who is wealthy and powerful in terms of their position, either economically? Well, he's or not that wealthy, is he? If he has to get someone else to pay for his child, mining. comparatively wealthy, uh, it, you know, upper middle class in British terms. Um, who you would imagine, uh, you know, dubious morals, who you would imagine people wouldn't like, but actually people end up seeing him as somehow or another sort of um, anti-elite and therefore somebody at a time when they are wanting to challenge the elite who they feel that they can get alongside. Is that the explanation? Because I do agree with you. You're right. I have consistently underestimated him. Mm. Well, I, I wonder... I mean, some people think he's just a very lucky politician whose luck will run out one day. And most politicians' luck do, does run out at some point. And it may be that he's brought down by all of the wallpaper thing. But I think that it, even if, he, even if the, he's found to have breached the ministerial code, even if the Electoral Commission find against him, I think he will legitimately be able to say, well, hang on a minute, look at all of the people that vote for me. I'll let the voters decide on this. I'm not resigning. I'm not going anywhere. Can we, um, Liam Martin Lane has just made the next point that I wanted to move on to, which is the sort of straw that those of us uh, who are Labour supporting are clinging to and has begun to emerge over the last few days. And that is that actually what we're seeing is a really quite fundamental demographic 
shift mm. and that we ought to be looking at seats like the mayor of the west of England or Cambridgeshire, which earlier on I noticed um, what Labour had won some seats in Cambridgeshire. So in other words, well, that's, got, that's got to know overall control now. And London, where, you know, so um, one of the defences of what's happened is, you know, everybody's banging on about how Labour's lost these so-called red wall seats. The Tories are practically nowhere in London now. There well, has been an enormous... You, you say that. Oh, right. You sure. say that. Oh. Now, is Sean Bailey feeling hopeful? Well, um, I had a little message earlier on from someone to say that they think it's going to be a lot closer than you might think. Now, I don't think that means that Sean Bailey is going to win. But say, for example, um, it's 45 to Labour, 35 to the Tories. I mean, I would say that's that's that would actually be quite a decent result, given that Sat Goldsmith only got 25 percent. Well, not least given, as I say, this straw that we're hanging on to, which is that actually we have seen a shift of Labour support to, or, or there's this demographic change where Labour appeals to younger metropolitan um, voters, who the type of whom you find in large cities, your, your Londons, your Manchesters, and increasingly in the southeast, you find moving out of those cities because they can't afford to buy houses and therefore mm. taking that type of more, I would call it slightly more sort of progressive, slightly more left leaning voting behavior into some of those areas in in the southeast. Is that I mean, that's not going to be enough in any way to get a Labour government. Uh, and funnily enough, I do remember. Was it 2015 when I had a row with Rachel um what's her surname political Thompson? no no I always have a no I do Sylvester? always have a row with her. no um uh shabby shabby Rachel shabby no no a keep came to our rescue though thank you Noah uh Rachel shabby who at the point at which I was saying this it's a disaster for Labour if you can't win seats like Nuneaton which is now, I think, either no overall control or no, Tory. No, no, the Tories really, have won that for the first right. time since, for a long time anyway, I can't yeah. I think it was 2008. And she said, what you don't understand, Jackie, is that there are new areas where, in that, at that point, um, uh, I think it was, it was, it must have been 2017 probably, anyway, there are new places where Corbyn is attractive, there's a big demographic shift, this is what we need to concentrate on. I thought she was talking nonsense, now I'm clutching that straw as well. But actually, fundamentally, I still think it's nonsense, because unless you build a, um, a coalition, the like of which we saw in 1997, you're not going to get a Labour government. So the challenge for Keir Starmer now and the Labour Party is getting back to that. Well, I think part of their problem is that they may now lose that hard left uh, element. Uh, and not just that, but the, 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 the sort of middle class sort of. I don't know, environmentalist, tree hugging, whatever you want to call it, a uh, group of people. And I think there are a lot of those around now who, if they get too disenchanted with Labour, they could easily go to the Greens. And I think what we're going to see in the local council elections, I think the Greens are already gaining seats, maybe not hundreds, but certainly I think they'll end up with um, more seats tomorrow than they, than they had last week. Um, and Can I just, uh, can I just quote Stephen Jakes in the, in the chat? Uh, I think that's his name. Um, he says, more smut and fewer excuses for results from Jackie. <laughs> now, the only reason I'm willing to quote you, Stephen, is because you correctly used fewer rather than less. Oh, we like that, yes. In that insult to me. <laughs> we can't just, like, deliver smut to order. It's got to be... We've got to be in it, the mood, haven't we, yeah, Ian? Yeah, quiet. And it's always more <laughs> difficult when we can see each other as well. So we like, we like <laughs> we it in the dark. We like it. We feel a bit coy, don't we? I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm almost blushing. I feel a little bit coy. I know you see it, Aaron. It, it is better to have the lights off, basically. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, now, listen, Rob, jo Rob Osborne, you're not paying attention. Oh, he is now paying attention. Rob Osborne is um, ITV political correspondent in Wales and is a great fan of the podcast. And he's he's multitasking at the moment because he's actually watching this at a count. Can, I, I don't know if Sean Rose, who's operating all this, can unmute Sean. Uh, he has just done so. Sean, would you like to give us a live report from whatever Rob. count you're at? Rob Osborne, not Rob Jones. Why Hello. Why say Rob Jones? Hello. Oh, my um, God. I'm, I'm broadcasting live. You on are. a podcast as well as television. <laughs> How are you both? We're you very both well. Have, by the way, as I have this platform, you both appeared on my TV show, Sharp End, so well, you, I'm returning the compliments. And it was a great honour. So what's going you on there? You, where are, where are you? On. This is Cardiff West, for all of you can see this. This is the seat of the First Minister, Mark Drakeford. Next door is Cardiff South and Carnarvon. That's the seat of the Health Minister, Vaughan Gethin, two people you will be familiar with. Now, if anybody's ever covered a count, um, there's a lot of excitement when you see people going through all the all the leaflets, you know, all the votes and all the slips. You think, oh, we can't be far off a declaration. Then you realise all they've done is verify the results, and that has taken hours and hours. So we are still nowhere near getting a result here in Cardiff, but I'll predict now that all the four Cardiff seats will be held by Labour. And the story in Wales overall is that Labour have probably outperformed expectations, and I imagine are very happy. Mark Drakeford, look, <clears throat> Labour have taken back the Ronda, we think. So that's Leanne Wood's seat. Do you remember she's the former leader of Ply Cymru? Big platform on the um, leaders' debates in the general election a few years ago. Um, Labour seem to have held on to places like Llanelli. Uh, they've held on to Wrexham, which was the Tories won. So Labour, for Wales, see Wales, don't see England. Mm. We're a very different but, political outfit. But what does Keir Starmer need to learn from that, Rob? What would Keir Starmer need to learn from To become that? even, to become as dull as Mark Drakeford. Well, has Mark Drakeford's dullness, if you want to put that, I, uh, I have no comments. Or, or, has, or that, a charismatically been, challenged. Has that been the effect that Wales have wanted? Professor Drakeford, scholar of Latin, what he is, is that what Wales wanted? The safe pair of hands. As, um, I think it was Hugh Edwards I was watching earlier on, summed up pretty well. Oh, there's Vaughan Gethin. Hey, turn around, get on for the many, the podcast. That's hey, hey, Ian we? Dale and Jackie Smith. Well, there's lovely to see you. Do you want to give them a little reaction as to what's happening? You're being broadcast live. Well, I'm feeling very positive about the results here. It could be a really a much better night than we thought a few months ago for us, Labour. Our response to the pandemic is not on the door, so it's including the vaccination program as well. So just a few more results to go and the lists, of course. How many seats you got at the moment? I don't know at the moment. We could end up, we could end up with 29, possibly 30. So, you know, we, we're still waiting for the results. But um, you told me with this position a few months ago, I was a bit here. Congratulations, Vaughan. Can, can Vaughan hear us, or do I have to go through you, Rob, to ask? No, him he, can, he can hear you. Um, Vaughan, your your public profile has shot up immeasurably over the past twelve months for obvious reasons, because you're health minister. How have you found that sort of more public recognition? Is it something that you've been comfortable with, or or do you find it a bit of a challenge? Well, most of the time, it's been pretty comfortable because people have been very positive. I, mean, I went to uh, Anglesey in the Easter break. Uh, not somewhere you'd know if you walk around normally, but lots and lots of people stopped us and said hello, which is unusual. But also they're really positive when they did so as well. So that has made a really big difference. And in a devolution election, we've normally only had the first minister being well known as a national figure. So to have two members of the government able to go out and be recognised, I think has also been a big plus. Mm. And as he's standing here, there will be a new first minister if Mark Drakeford is returned because he's promised he might step down about halfway through. Here's a potential candidate as the next First Minister of well, Wales. Vaughan Gethins, are, would you stand if the opportunity arose? You, you can reveal it exclusively on the For The Many podcast. It's not that exclusive. <laughs> I the last contest and finished uh, a creditable second. So who knows yeah. what the future will bring? That's a yes, you will. That's a yeah, yes. Exactly. That is such a yes. Listen, yeah, th yeah. thanks ever so Thank much. Thank you. Happy to talk to you. Take care. Cheers. Oh, Cheers. I, am, I am literally broadcasting yeah. live. You know. Well yeah. done. Well, well done, you. Rob. Well, that is you. the answer, by the way. That is the answer to why uh, Labour have done badly in England and Labour have done well in Wales. And it's the vaccination stroke handling COVID um, point. Because in Wales, the rollout of the vaccine is associated with Vaughan Gethin and Labour in control. And in 
England, it's associated with Boris Johnson. And Matt Hancock said a very, do you remember, I said this on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, Matt Hancock came to Birmingham and said a very, very similar thing about going on the doorstep and people sort of welcoming him with open arms and saying, oi, oi, come and, come and meet the guy that gave you your vaccine. That's yeah. been, a, I think that's been a massive influence in this election. Well, in a way, it's been, I, mean, I hesitate to make this analogy, but it, it's kind of Boris's Falklands factor, isn't it? Uh, and I thought that was Jersey that we're coming to. <laughs> oh, no, well, yeah, well, we will come to that a, a bit later. But I think there is something in that. And, and people, OK, the, the first nine months of the whole COVID crisis, there were many things that the government got wrong. And what I find... Um, slightly odd is that people who legitimately were criticising the government for all the things they got wrong, they cannot bring themselves to say, but the government have got this right. They say, oh no, it's all to do with the NHS. It's nothing to do with the government. Well, of course it is. It was Boris Johnson that appointed Kate Bingham. It was Matt Hancock, actually, who's in charge of the NHS, who put all the money into the vaccine in the first place. You've, if you're going to criticise the government when they get things wrong, surely it is incumbent on you to say, well, actually, you know, all credit due here, they got this right. No, it's completely legitimate, Ian, to say that decisions around the lockdown were wholly uh, with the advice of Siege in the purview of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. That's what they got wrong. When it then came to the vaccine, you're talking about a combination of our very, very good research base, strong um, uh, partnerships between pharma companies and that research base. And then you're talking about the fact that unlike the test and trace system, the government trusted the NHS and its immediate partners to deliver the vaccine. And guess what, including local government, and guess what, it went well. So I think it's completely legitimate to make that analysis of where the government got things wrong and where the rest of the system got things right. Yeah, well, so do I. But if where the government's got well, something right, why not have the, why not have the grace to say it? Okay, Kate Bingham got things got a lot of things right, and she was appointed <laughs> by the government. So I'll give her some credit for that. And give the government credit for appointing her, maybe. Yeah, well, you see, this this is where uh, I, I think this again. Th this is where Labour politicians. I mean, most people in the country, whether you like it or not, are going to give Boris the credit for this. Now, I said, that wasn't that just the point I bloody well made? Yeah, grudgingly. No, that was the point I made when I drew the analogy with, with Kevin. Well, Kevin. Maybe, I, maybe I misunderstood you, which I often do. No, you were just um, trying to create. You just trying to create discord where there is none. As if. Yeah. I did a bit of that on the radio last night with Denise. Because we were talking about the, the ONS published figures yesterday, uh, which showed that the take up among different ethnic minorities was still much lower than among white people. Uh, admittedly, the gaps closed. Um, so we were talking about that. And she was going on about how um, so we've got to take into account black history, that there's a great mistrust of um, medical people because of experiments that have been carried on, blah, blah, blah. And um, and she's going about, well, of course, it's, sort of the, it's all about the discrimination. I said, well, OK, but I don't hear lots of gay people saying that they don't uh, trust the vaccine. So what, what's the difference? And she said, oh, you can't compare discrimination against gay people with discrimination against black people. I said, oh, yes, you can, actually. Um, I said, you go, you go back centuries and there's been discrimination against gay people. It's not just in the last sort of 40 or 50 years. Um, and I thought that was actually quite, I mean, we didn't, it was slightly off the subject, so we didn't develop that, but um, it got a lot of people phoning in. I mean, a lot of gay people were absolutely outraged by what she'd said. It's, yeah, I mean, let's, let's not get into um, the difficulties of pitting one oppression against another, because that is a uh, very lengthy conversation that we that we might have but um but it, i mean it's a legitimate point to make but it's equally it's understandable and legitimate for some people from it's been particularly i think black communities who have made that case about why they are um why there is that sort of well, vaccine surely, reticence i'm it, not saying it's right but you, that is a, yeah. isn't that an but if you historical, accept, understandable if position. If you accept that that is a logical position, maybe for people to take at the beginning of this, that's one thing. But when you see 
that the vaccine rollout has been excellent. When you see a lot of your friends and colleagues from uh, ethnic, ethnic minorities have taken it, when you see that the figures prove that it's really contributed to the fact that we now have a very low incidence of coronavirus in this country. I mean, you have to be pretty thick not to say, OK, well, I'm going to take it now. Don't yeah, but you? The problem here, Ian, is, yeah, OK, I, have, I was frustrated, particularly at the beginning of the vaccine rollout, about the reticence of some people to take it. What I have learned is saying you're bloody thick for not taking it, is not going to be the way in no, which we're going to I, get I'm not, people I'm not to the public the face of the, vac- of the people who do the marketing. But I, I just think that there must be something that is more than just, oh, well, because they've done experiments in the 1950s, I'm not going to take it. I mean, if that was the view at the beginning, it can't be the view now, surely. It's not as if different ethnic minorities no, are being, that, gi- being given different vaccines. We're all getting the same It's vaccine. a bit more than that. It's about whether or not you feel alienated or part of the system that is asking you to trust it and if on a whole range if for a whole range of reasons you feel you're not getting a fair crack of the whip you will be much more suspicious about what you're being asked to do for the good of others not just for the good of yourself let's not forget that you know the pe- the point of a vaccine is yes it helps me but actually it shields others. Mm. And that's an art, you know, that what you're basically asking me to do is to be altruistic. And if I feel that actually the people I'm being asked to protect have not given me a fair crack of the whip, I'll be much less likely to, be, to want to be part of that. I've just been flicking through the people watching and I've come across page three boys, so, well, to, sp- so to speak. Some... <laughs> so, see, look, now you've made me blush again. Somebody has <laughs> just called him a silver fox, which is actually true. <laughs> oh he's now disappeared i wonder if he's if he's decided i told him to turn his camera off no 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 oh, no, no, no he's still he's still there there's a, there's a touch of the alex ferguson's about him isn't there oh he'll be delighted to hear that <laughs> he'll be totally delighted That's to the hear younger that. better looking alex ferguson <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah, Handsome. you've, got, you've gone, you all, go. you've gone all flustered now. I've gone all unnecessary. Um, now, Sean, who is Master of Ceremonies here, has asked me to remind people only to use the chat box for questions. Use the hashtag for the many on Twitter if you want to have a discussion about what's uh, going on. Um, let's move on to Scotland. Um, no great surprises there, I don't think. The SNP seem to have gained a couple of seats. I think one from Labour, one from the Conservatives so far. Um, I'm not sure what there is to say about that because I think we, we all we'll probably, do that tomorrow. Yeah, I think. Oh, we sorry, probably, Sunday. We we yeah. probably think that the SNP are going to get majority. The interesting thing is the the Alba Party or the Alip is it Alipa? Is that how he pronounces it? Um, they. Oh You're just playing into everybody's view that we talk about Scotland and we know f all about it, though, Ian. Labour have just gained Rhonda from Plaid. There you go, you see? Yeah. Um, you heard it from Rob first, don't forget. Yeah, we, well, actually, we did, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Um, but they've only got 2.2% of the vote in the constituencies that have counted in the so far in the list system. So it doesn't look as if they're going to get anybody, maybe. So that would be a little bit of a blow. So Alex Salmon's very successful interview with you did not cut through in the way in which he obviously <laughs> hoped it was going to, Ian. Um, I think he's done lots more interviews than just the one with me, but I did. I did quite enjoy that. I have to say, it, the monkey. I, have I have I said this before that um, Matt, who was my old producer on um, Drive, he was watching that, and as we were going on, he was WhatsApping me saying, "Have you said it before? You said it last Saturday." Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, it's it's. <laughs> I mean, people age. love. It's, it's like age. I think people tune into this podcast for the for the sort of themes you know, like Ian telling the story that he told last week, me saying to him, you told that story last week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're cracking um, on a bit now. You, you're getting a bit old. Well, we're both... Um, how old am I going to be in July? 59. We're both 60 next year. Yeah. We both have a... a well, I have my 60th bucket list. Yeah, I haven't actually created a bucket list yet. Crack on, crack on. Mind you, um, the, the thing I, the little secret I told you this morning, that, oh, that yes. would coincide <gasps> with the 60th, wouldn't it? That would be, that is, um, <laughs> that would fill your bucket if that came true. But tease, you, obviously tease, you can't tease. reveal what it is. No, can't. Stop it, stop it. It's not that, it's not that. No, it's not. <laughs> 
Um, oh my god! See, I just realized. People say on, I can't dance. Hang on, my battery is about to go. I forgot to plug the um, the thing. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, Alan McPhee. We've talked about the you know just a few of the significant contests that have happened today. But the most significant contest that people are interested in, Ian, is were you thrashed on the golf course again today? No, I was oh. playing golf. Did you nine, not play? I did play <laughs> nine holes with Tom Swarbrick, um, my OBC colleague. Um, actually, it's really funny because there was a guy playing behind us on his own. And at one point we just said, do, do you want to play through? Um, and he said, no, 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 that's fine. And then about three holes later, the people in front of us um, were having a bit of trouble. So there was a bit of a queue and he was just sitting on a bench. And I said, oh, well, we've given you a rest. He said, and he laughed. He said, oh, by the way, love your radio show. And I looked at Tom Swarbrick and I said, and I just said to the guy, yeah, he's on the radio too. So to Tom was gutted that he wasn't recognised. Tom's gorgeous. He's a lovely, lovely guy. Anyway. Not we that played, you're not, of course. We played, <laughs> we played nine, nine holes. I was two up after two holes. Um, he then, I think, won the next two or three, but we ended up all square. So, um, and I played much better than last time. Thereby so. demonstrating the excitement of golf, Ian. <laughs> well, you did ask. No, I asked. I asked. You're right. You're right. Should we give I the asked. poll result? <laughs> yeah, go on. See, this is really interesting. And this, this is really typical of the For The Many podcast. Uh, Conservatives, 38%. Labour, 37%, Liberal Democrats, 10%, Green, 4 SNP, 4 Plaid, 0 and others, 8 So I, I'm quite pleased with that, because if it, if it was like 60-20 or something, I think a bit of us would have died, wouldn't it? Both of us would have felt, if we hadn't brought our... I mean, we're not tribal, are we? But if we hadn't brought our tribes with us, then we would have felt a little bit like we'd let ourselves down can I just say hello to Kat from my yoga class which I missed this evening in order to do this podcast because yoga should usually be Friday evening um, and she's just finished yoga with the rest of the gang and she's now watching so hi Kat and thanks very much and yes Ian does have coming to a yoga class on his 60th birthday bucket list not sure I do, but if I come and if I come and visit you at some point, and I'm there on a night when you do yoga, I will. I promise I will. There we go. Accompany you. You heard in, it. There are lots in of in my lycra. I don't have any lycra. But... Yoga tends to be. Um, you can wear lycra for yoga, but I think I I'd like to see you in those sort of baggy <laughs> yoga pants with a big droopy crotch bit. <laughs> oh, you, you mean like like these? <laughs> What was that? What was that? What have you got oh. down your trousers? <laughs> I've got my microphone lead. <laughs> yeah, <You're> right. <laughs> oh, the earpiece has come out. Um, harem pants. Thank you. Yes, somebody has just given me the name. Harem pants. Harem pants. Yeah, yeah. Or I you think... could get. What are your legs like? You could get your legs out. My legs are a bit short. Are they? Yeah. Short, short fat, hairy legs. That's. They're not particularly fat, but I've always... That was I, a more my, than wise reference. That wasn't a you reference. Oh, was it? All right, OK. Mm. Um, Le, somebody's saying Leanne Wood has just lost the Ronda. Yeah, we know. We've been told that twice now. Rob told you that, and then Ian told you that. If you're not going to listen, get off the <laughs> podcast. For goodness sake, pay attention. <laughs> Honestly, Leanne Wood, who's... Oh, have you noticed, whenever Leanne Wood speaks, every sentence begins in the same way. Here in Wales... It's very annoying. Well, she is in what? Yeah, I know, just... but why does she have to keep Rob is, saying Rob it all is the looking, time? Rob is looking really angry. Rob, <laughs> by the way, yeah. By the way, Rob, my Duolingo is going very well. Go on then. Do we, Jackie? <laughs> uh, Boreda. Do we, Jackie? What does that mean? I am Jackie. Oh, I thought that was going to mean something interesting, but uh, <laughs> clearly not. Um, oh, Jane Ellison is watching former Conservative MP. She's in Geneva. She works for the World Health Organization now. Hello, Jane. Jane was really helpful, wasn't she? In Do you remember way back when we started talking about vaccinations and sharing the um, vaccine across the world, which I think we should come on to into, in a moment, actually, some more discussion about vaccinations. 
Jane was very helpful in explaining, introducing us to the idea of COVAX, I think, and the work yeah. that was happening to share the vaccine. Before we move on to that, can I just say hello as well to Kim, uh, Kim Ledbeater, um, who is uh, the sister of Joe Cox. And you will, all of you, remember that you, we are doing, you've had to pay, first of all, to, to have the joy of this podcast this evening. And we are donating that money to the Joe Cox Foundation. So it is lovely to have uh, Kim join us. Luckily, Kim knows that I have a tendency to be smutty, so it's not gonna to be too much of a shock um, for uh, her. Although I think we've been quite clean so far, haven't yeah. we? Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Lovely, lovely to have you um, with us, Kim, and um, thank you to everybody for the, the contribution that will go to the foundation. And, and the interesting thing is I've had quite, well, I say quite a few, maybe a dozen or so people say that they couldn't make it after all tonight and so they've they've sent a sort of refund request and then in the notes they said we don't actually want a refund we just want to free the place um, unfortunately can't do that so I basically haven't really done a refund to to most people um, so it, basically the Joe Cox Foundation will be better off uh, after the um, event bright fees that are taken off which are extortionate um, will be at least two thousand pounds so hopefully you can all put that to good use um, now I just discovered, um, where is he? Where's he gone? Joseph Moore. Sean, can you unmute Joseph Moore, please? Because I think before we go to the next part of our political discussion, we want to hear what happened when Joseph took either my advice or Jackie's advice. Um, Joseph, you are unmuted. You are on screen. Hello. Tell us what happened. Um, so I went for Auntie Jackie. Did you? Yes. Oh, so there isn't a story then? No. I decided <laughs> to say... <laughs> I think I... What, uh, a, what a fucking liberty! <laughs> yeah, well, I think I shot myself in the foot anyway, because when she turned up, I told her that she looked like Caroline Hearn off the uh, royal family. Oh. Joseph, Joseph. So did you not tell her your feelings? No. <laughs> mm. I feel bad having given you that advice now. What's happened yeah. since then? How is your love life? Just share it with 500 people. Well, just globally. You just, what? Um, not, not, not much happening, to be honest. Oh. Right. But okay. We're going to well, keep... Uh, hopefully lockdown's ending, although I've, I've read today in Bolton that the cases have shot up, so they're saying we might be in a local lockdown again. Well, that's your punishment, I'm afraid, for not having the courage of your convictions. But we've all done it, haven't we, Jackie? Have you have you ever had this sort of unrequited love where you really fancy somebody but couldn't actually quite bring yourself to admit it? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly tricky situation. No, 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 no. I'm, have I? Not even uh, well, having it with Tony Blair. Oh, that wasn't unrequited. I told him I loved him every day, for goodness sake, <laughs> as I continue to. <laughs> Have we yeah, talked about his mullet yet? Did we do that last Saturday? We did his mullet. Yeah. We've done his mullet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I voted Labour for the first time last night. Oh, well God, done. Why did I have you on? What made you do oh, that? No, the only, because my because uh, the councillor in where we live in Bolton is UK, and he barred my dad from his pub when he was 18, and my dad's now 56. And so we don't like the UK councillor, so we just wanted to get him out for that. Did you hear that? Joseph's dad is younger than us. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well done, Joseph. Can I ask a slightly political question? Oh, go on. Push your luck. <laughs> yeah, I might as well. I paid a fiver. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> clapping that. <laughs> well done, you. Because <laughs> I was thinking this last night, and for my father's generation... I've seen during lockdown that my dad works bloody hard during the day, uh, earning every single penny that I can get. He's on a modest income of, say, 50000 and every time he gets a pay rise, it gets taxed uh, to hell on it, and he doesn't actually make that pay rise. And for people in my generation who have been to university, gone through the mill, and then are struggling to get jobs at the moment, how does any one party approach 
both contacts and win over both sets of voters at the same time. Well, is that, that is surely the key. Is what? Sorry, the key. That surely is the key for Labour at getting in the next election. Well, it's it's so, what you've what you've essentially summed up there, Joseph, is the challenge for any political party that wants to win a general election. How do you gain both? Um, although I, in both those cases, I think what um, I, I don't think those are two opposite ends of the spectrum. What you described in terms of your your dad and you, I think what you've got in common is wanting to make the most out of your lives, not feel that the government is taking more from you than it needs to, but a bit of support in order to get on. And how you create that, how you communicate as a political party that that's what you're about is the way in which you win general elections. And that's what Keir Starmer's got to do now, essentially, in order to get over what's happened today. Perhaps yeah. he ought to have you as a one, you and your dad as a sort of two-person focus group. Advisor. Well, he needs a few well, advisors, doesn't um, he? Let's face it. Did well, you see I, that awful interview he did this afternoon, Jackie, with Vicky Young on the BBC? I mean, I just thought it was one of the worst pieces of PR I've ever I've seen in in recent times. I didn't see it. What was wrong? What was wrong well, with it? All the lots I, I, of people at Joseph, lots of people in the chat are saying Joseph for PM. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> says I already trust him more than Boris. Yeah, but that's not a very high bar, <laughs> is it? For God's sake. <laughs> hey, I like Boris a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why do you like him? Why do you like him? Why do I like Boris? Because for a lot of people in the north of England, and I hate to say this to you, Jackie, after being an MP, but it feels like for a lot of people in my generation and a lot of people in their 20s and the 30s, that Westminster hasn't <laughs> listened to them for 20, 30 years. And it feels like only now we've got someone who understands what's going on in the, in the North and lack of investment. And I get that might be a cliche with what's, but with what was promised in the manifesto and whether that is actually delivered before the next election, who knows? Do you know well, what, Joseph? I think, that lot, I think a lot of people bought into that at that last election and still do. That That is really... Um, interesting. Uh, sorry, that, that, that's me being a bit vague. Um, what I find really counterintuitive is the way in which the Tories are winning seats on the basis, essentially, of a sort of public spending message. So they're saying, oh, yeah. if you want more investment and more jobs, so they are well and truly camped on what should have been traditionally a sort of Labour or left position if you want more investment and jobs vote Tory and people are doing it um now I think it's down to who's the better salesman though effectively for each party well I do because I don't actually believe the Tories can deliver that and as I said on Good Morning Britain this morning um there will become a very difficult tension in the Tory party at the point at which Rishi Sunak has to to because he said he wanted to, you know, I don't necessarily think he should do this, but Rishi Sunak talks a lot about balancing the books and all of those Tory things that Ian would want to see happening. You cannot both balance the books and continue to invest in the way that the North, I suspect, would need. And that's when you'll get a very, you'll get a sort of, I mean, I, Ian will know better than me, but I think there is already a bit of tension inside the Tory party between those who need that, because that's essentially the basis on which they won their seats from Labour, and those who are much more traditionally sort of small government Tories. And when that comes to a head, I think it will be quite difficult. For well, I think that, that is a really interesting point, because there, I, I think you've got a lot of the 2019 intake, some of the 2017 intake, who are uh, representing all of these northern and midland seats who are both very different characters uh, in terms of personalities to a lot of the more southern southeastern east anglian mps um, and you might well get a point i don't know when it would come 
but where you've got these two competing elements within the Conservative Parliamentary Party, a bit like the sort of the anti-Corn Laws people and the pro-Corn Laws people, in, I mean, maybe not quite to that extent. And I don't History think lesson lead... on For the Many as well today. Well, indeed. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it would lead to a fracture in the Conservative Party in that sense. But you've always... Look, all political parties are coalitions. You, you've got... Um, in Thatcher's day, you had the wets and the dries, people who were sort of economic conservatives um, and people who w weren't, people who wanted to maintain the Butskalite consensus that had existed for maybe, I don't know, 30 years. So th this is nothing new in a way. All political parties have these, um, th these conflicts and you've got that in the Labour Party now. Um, mm. with the Corbynites and, and the rest. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that resolves itself. Particularly in our, partic in our political system, which tends towards two large parties because of our, certainly for Westminster um, voting system, we create our coalitions within our parties as opposed to creating them after elections with each other, like you would see in, let's say, in Germany or... Um, uh, or wherever. Although some people in the Labour Party essentially are arguing that one of the reasons why we're in the difficulties that we're in today is because Keir hasn't been bold enough in um, in actually narrowing the scope. That he he's been too interested in trying to keep uh, a broad coalition in the Labour mm. Party on board, and actually, of course what he needs to do is to stop thinking about the membership of the Labour Party and start thinking about what the country thinks. The danger for any political party is to go, is to think that its members are representative of what it needs to win in order to, to get um, form a government. Linda Gilroy, your former colleague who's um, in, watching today, she says, warm words, butter, no parsnips. We need someone who can portray the strong values that we hold. Lisa Nandy was and is a far better storyteller. You see, already today, You've got Andrew Adonis coming out saying that Keir Starmer has to go, which I did think. Oh yeah, has yeah, he, said that? he has said that, oh, and I thought, no. well, he's missing the limelight. Um, if I want to be unkind, oh, you bitch! I know, um, <laughs> and I like Andrew Adonis, but uh, um, I think that the, the, the knives are out now. People have requested a sight of Bubba and Dude, so they are now going to get Dude. Come on, come here, come on, up. come on, come on. And if you're interested, this... Here, this is Dude. He's a handsome fellow. He escaped three is he, weeks he ago. Did, he was the runaway dog, wasn't he? He was the runaway dog. Mm -hmm. So that's Dude. And um, <laughs> John won't appear on camera, so he's trying to pass me Bubba. Do you want to say hello to the... No. <laughs> <laughs> threw, threw Bubba at you. <laughs> and this is Bubba, who's, who's been oh, to the dog gorgeous. groomers, haven't you, Bubba? Yes, yes, you have. Can people? There this you go. One, this works really well on the podcast, this? doesn't it? Hello, yeah. Hello, darling. There she is. <laughs> anyway, back to Keir Starmer. So, do you? Th how quickly do you think he's going to do a reshuffle? I think he probably. One of the reasons why I think he did, I didn't hear that interview, but I suspect that. Uh, today is a good example of one of his weaknesses. I think he's got a lot of strengths and I don't think he should resign. But one of his weaknesses is not having been in political life as long as some others. He hasn't experienced what it's like yeah. to have to react to the, to the really difficult stuff that he's facing um, today. Uh, I think he will do. I think probably now he will do a reshuffle. Uh, as lots of people, including in the chat, are asking... Is he going to be bringing back some sort of big beasts, Yvette Coulery, Ben, uh, and others? Because um, that would be the thing, I suppose, that would strengthen the shadow cabinet. But he's also, and this happens in all political parties, he also has to be aware that there are people who are taking a long view about who the next leader might be and may be organising, and he doesn't want to put himself in a position where he's constantly fighting those internal battles. So, yes, I think he'll reshuffle the shadow cabinet, but he shouldn't get, you know, he shouldn't spend too much time focused on that. And people who want Labour to win shouldn't spend too much time focused on that, because particularly in opposition, yes, you need a strong team, but it's actually what the leader does that is most um Alex Bolton has a question for you, Jackie. When Jackie is elevated to the House of Lords, which shadow cabinet position would you like? Well, one, that ain't going to happen. Um, no, I don't know. 
Oh, my campaign you. is still going. Yeah. Are you the right campaign manager for this <laughs> campaign? I'm beginning to wonder. Should I reshuffle I have my sing- campaign? Team? I have single handedly resurrected you. <laughs> Hey, that is an interesting point. You you have played quite a big role in my move from serious, highly respected senior politician to smutty mouthed commentator. I'd like to think I've done a little bit more than that. But, um, <laughs> anyway, um, so do you think it will be really unfair? Um, and I certainly do, if Annalise Dodds is the one that cops the flack for all of this. Yes. Because um, it's not just her, it's all of them. And they've all got to take collective yeah. responsibility for this. Yeah. And But it, I think, I mean, there were rumours this morning that she might be sacked completely from the Shadow Cabinet. Well, I mean, if you are demoted, I mean, Shadow Chancellor is the most important role in the Shadow Cabinet. Do you think she would accept a lesser role? I don't really know. I don't know Annalisa very well. Um, I think she's done a good job as Shadow Chancellor, but we are at that point where uh, I think, I mean, as I say, I don't think shifting the personnel is the answer to this. I think it's something more radical in terms of addressing policies that will attract the country. But you have invited me to um, comment on the personnel. So, um I don't know if she would stay in the in the shadow cabinet or not if she was moved to role because it is very very difficult to go you know some people do it but it's very difficult to go mm. down in your political life in terms of um uh, your sort of profile and the status of the of the role that that you've got um what was the rest of the question well who who else because a lot of Labour's big beasts are not there anymore. They're not on the back benches, and everyone trots out Yvette Cooper and Hillary Benn. Well, I'm not so sure that they would relish the opportunity that Keir Starmer might want to provide them with. Yvette Cooper, I think, quite likes being chair of the Home Affairs Select Committee. You get another, what, 20 grand on your salary for being a Select Committee chair. Um, Hillary Benn might think, well, I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt. Why would I want to go back? And what position would he be offered? Mm. Um I mean, Nick Thomas Simmons, who I rather like, I think he's quite impressive, but has he cut it really as Shadow Home Secretary? Not so sure. Um, you could say, well, that's an ideal one for Hillary Benn. And I think all across the political spectrum, people like Hillary Benn. Um, but who else is there from days gone by? And, and it, what does it say if you just resurrect a lot of people yeah. from the past? Well, let's not forget, you're never more popular as a politician than when you're not in the front line anymore, right? Mm. Um and it's much tougher to be there making, you know, on the way up than it is to be sort of lauded for how great it would be if you came back. Uh, and I'm not sure that is the answer, really. I think the answer is to look to the future. But or to come back to my previous point, I don't think uh, just shifting people around is the answer. I think it's something uh, more profound about what we're saying to the public about what Labour stands for and will do. The reason I'm sympathetic to Keir Starmer is that, you know, frankly, and somebody put a question earlier on about is Labour suffering from long Corbyn? Um, (laughs) uh, Now, I'm not going to blame Jeremy Corbyn for the fact that we have lost this year, but Keir Starmer had a hell of a job and his team had one hell of a job to do to get the party back to the position where it could even begin to make a case to the country because unlike what happened even at the beginning of the 1980s in the Labour Party essentially you had a I would call it a takeover of the organization of the Labour Party the senior or the senior staff of the Labour Party the the leader's office shifting that took a has taken a lot of work this year um, and a lot of focus which has prevented Keir being able to look outwards, as of course has the pandemic. It's really difficult to be the leader of the opposition in the last year because, you know, people have gone from saying, oh, you've got to be constructive opposition, Keir, to why weren't you more aggressive at, at the point at which you should have been? In actual fact, if we look back over the last year, Keir Starmer got a lot of things right about the speed with which we should have locked down, the approach that we should have taken to test and trace. Those things, actually, he got right. 
What he now needs to do is to be clearer about who he is and what Labour will do. And I've still got confidence that um, he can do that and bring Labour back to a position where hopefully we won't be facing results like this again. It, it does come to something, though, when no Labour politician today that I've seen has been able to answer the question, what needs to be done differently? I mean, they, they bang on about fairness and equality, but well, mother of an apple pie, um, as if other political parties don't want fairness and equality. No, you're just jumping on the Kate Garraway bandwagon there, Ian. Oh, am I? But yeah, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> no, no, um, Sorry. no, um, I don't, I don't even think if you'd, if you'd confronted Tony Blair at his peak and said, right, come on, come on, what does Labour stand for? I, I'm not sure he would have had the sort of answer that, that you're looking for, because people are looking for both that vision thing and they're looking for the policies that manifest that vision. And you don't do that in one answer to a journalist when you're on the back foot. Um, we haven't talked about, well, we talked to Rob about Wales, um, but the, the Conservatives haven't done as well there as I think they hope to. Um, I think presumably the, the government is going to continue in roughly the same way that it is at the moment. But they will need some outside support. The Liberal Democrats may be completely wiped out in Wales, apparently. Um, uh, it's your explanation for that purely because um, Mark Drakeford has handled the vaccine. I know we covered this a little bit already. Um, do you think there are other issues at play there? I, I'm not really an expert on Wales, so I wouldn't like to know, but I do think, the, wouldn't to say, but I do think the strongest factor in this election is who is associated with people feeling more confident about coming out of the pandemic and getting their vaccine. I, I think that's, I think when we look back on this, that's going to be a really decisive factor in. Um, who does well. And of course, Nicola Sturgeon was seen as handling the, rightly or wrongly, was seen as handling the pandemic well also. And she will, um, I think, do quite well out of that in Scotland. Should we move on to talk about um, Jersey? Because <laughs> I've been gagging to do that all the time. I, th this story broke on Wednesday when I was hosting Cross Question. You are the Bergerac of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, do you remember that, I don't know if you remember that drama series about the Nazi invasion of the Channel Islands, uh, where Lawrence Fox played the Nazi? I mean, no! The, the very thought. <laughs> Surely not. I know, I know, it's unbelievable, isn't it? Amazing. Um, no, let's not talk about no. how many votes he's got, let's not, no, no. <laughs> Well, it comes to something when uh, the Brexit party decide to throw their lot in with him in London. Um, I thought mm. that was bizarre. Anyway, um, th this broke during my show on Wednesday. And so I put this the, the question to uh, my panel as to whether they thought that it was right to send uh, patrol boats, which some people called warships, which I then said, no, 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 they're not warships, they're patrol boats, but apparently they do have weapons on them. Yeah, not only do they have weapons on them, but they were com they are Brexit warships. <laughs> they were commissioned because of the what people felt would happen, what the government felt would happen as a consequence of Brexit. Yeah, I mean, you, if that doesn't tell but, you that Brexit but, is a bad thing, that you have but to but people were saying warships. that the government hadn't prepared properly for Brexit. Well, this proves that they. <laughs> <laughs> what you mean they'd spent good taxpayers' money on warships in order to get us out of the EU? <laughs> Well, I suppose inevitably, what, whatever agreement had been reached on fisheries, there were always going to be disagreements. But of course, um, most people, I don't think, have the faintest idea about what this is, uh, what happened here. And I must admit, when it all started, I didn't. And it was only when I interviewed the leader of the Jersey Fishermen, uh, was it last night? I think it was last night. Uh, I had to interview the leader of the Jersey Fishermen, uh, a French general, Dominique Tancan, who had been a former military advisor to President Macron, and also a French MEP, Bruno Bonelli. Uh, and it was only when I'd interviewed the French, the, the Jersey fisherman guy, that I could rather understood exactly mm. what had happened. Because uh, after Brexit, um, th there was obviously got to be, there had to be a new licensing regime. So Jersey decided that they would issue licenses based on whether you'd been fishing in Jersey waters before Brexit. Now, out of 41 
boats that had to be licensed, 24 of them had the proof that they had done that. And the others had been warned time and time and time again that if they didn't provide the evidence by such and such a date, then a licence couldn't be issued. And that, that's been at the crux of this. You'd have thought the French would have been good at paperwork. <laughs> so I then said to the, the, the fisherman, Jersey fisherman guy, I said, so how many, boat, how many Jersey boats are allowed to fish in French waters? And he said, none. Well, I arguably, said, well, Jersey is in French waters. No. When you look at a well, map, no. Jersey is practically France, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know, but then they have to apply for licenses to France or the European Union, I don't know which, in exactly the same way that the French fisher people have to apply for us. And the and the French authorities have refused to provide any licenses, despite the fact that the forms have been filled in correctly, they've got all the proof that they need, not a single license has been issued. So um, I, I do find it rather bizarre that people like John Burko and one or two others who've appeared on the media on this seem to automatically side with the French when they know bugger all about the situation. Well, Daniel Gray, who quite hilariously says, I don't even think Project Fear predicted a war with France, <laughs> has also said, I think we need to hear from our EU expert, Page Three Boy. I I, all I can say about him is that he is an EU expert, but he doesn't specialise in France. He's rather more, if you remember, as the Daily Mail pointed out, he speaks Russian, which is Daily Mail code for, you know, he's basically a spy and Jack is being like Mataharid or whatever. You're, you're determined not to let him on this podcast, Yeah, he's not you? speaking. He's not speaking. <laughs> Are you a man or a mouse, page three, boy? I mean, honestly. <laughs> um, now, was it right, though, to send in, the, send in the boats, do you think? And do you do you think that, like some other people on your side of the political fence, that this was a political decision designed to get people out to vote to support a patriotic Conservative government? Seriously, what I feel about this is that... Patriotic Tory government. Seriously, what I think about this is the fact that it even is happening is a, a condemnation is, is a sort of um, is what many of us said would happen uh, in terms of Brexit. And my worry about this is that as far as I, I have seen so far, and I, and I know you think I'm biased, but genuinely, I cannot see the benefits of Brexit so far what vaccines. i can see vaccines that's all you need to know no well i we've had this argument before <laughs> and that is not a benefit of brexit it is absolutely is. no it is not I, no, I'll, tell, I'll tell you why it is because if scotland had been independent and had been in the european union scotland would have gone along with the european vaccination scheme i have absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever and the vaccination rate in scotland instead of being what it is now would be a fraction of what it is now that is a benefit of brexit no this is a counterfactual that you just cannot prove because of course i can't had, prove had, it but i think everybody listening UK, will know that i'm right well there are two things that could have happened one the uk wasn't forced by its by being a uh, a part of the eu to be part of that uh, EU procurement and secondly every other country one has, the, has gone along with it though well just a minute and secondly the very fact that the UK is in the EU often mitigated against some of the worst potential excesses of the EU that has now been removed from the EU and we're surprised that they're less effective because we're not part of them so um <laughs> she says so as if that means that she's well, automatically I'm right. right I am right <laughs> I am right. So um, what do I think about um, sending the warships? First of all, I think that, um, as I say, taking a step back, the very fact that we're in this situation is a result of Brexit. Secondly, I do, you know, I'm not so sure that those ships would have been sent had we not, if I'm completely honest, had we not been in an election, or put it this way, I'm not sure there would have been quite so much briefing about the sending of the ships had we been not been in an election week uh, i asked tom swarwick if because he used to be uh theresa may's head of broadcasting and i asked him this afternoon whether he thought that she would have done the same thing and he said absolutely because it was the right thing to do and it did get rid of those pesky french fisher boats didn't it <laughs> they were sent back to harbour 
with their tail between their legs. Exactly. With their cod <laughs> between their legs. Or Rule that. Britannia. <laughs> Did you know, by the way, um, yes, Tom Stevens is uh, touching his Union Jack, if you're, that's not a euphemism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, did you know oh, that... Shit, you have not got, you haven't got a flag in the background. No, because I should I'm, have had I'm my EU cons- flag in the background, I'm not a Conservative I? politician. In fact, people have commented on my top. I could have had a series of gold stars on my blue shirt couldn't i you could have had one on each nipple (laughs) three then (laughs) actually i knew someone with three nipples once it's quite common wasn't it wasn't it the man with the golden gun was it (laughs) yeah in the man with the golden gun the baddie has Three nipples, I think. I'm right in saying. I don't remember. Sca- there we go. Scaramanga, you see? I don't remember that. That is true. Um, did you know that on the day that uh, the the gunboats were sent, it was the 200th anniversary of the death of Napoleon? And there was much Well, there, I didn't know that, which makes me... <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that Emmanuel Macron might have to go into exile on the Falklands. <laughs> Right. But it, even the French MEP that I talked to, who I'd had a real row with once over Brexit, even he thought that that French agriculture minister was out of line in what she said about cutting the power off. Because if she hadn't said that, I doubt yeah. very much whether those boats would have been sent. But I mean, you can't, as a, yeah. as a sovereign government, you can't just sit back and not react to that, can you? Frankly? No, I, I, I agree. Um, whether or not it needed the boats, I don't know. But it was the ships. But it was outrageous to suggest you were going to remove the power from Jersey. Yeah. Although that does slightly make my point that Jersey is practically part of France because they actually get 90% of their power through pipes. Doesn't power go through wires? But anyway, don't know. through things that go under the sea to them. Somebody says, Ian, uh, this is from Louis Herdage. What's the German for garlic eating surrender monkeys? <laughs> I get into trouble, though, if I say yeah. anything about the French, don't I? Because we do have one or two people who live in France who don't like it um, when I do that. We have lots of people, including some on this podcast I've seen from Twitter, who are from a, from abroad. Yes, we have someone from Jersey as well, which isn't abroad. <gasps> but Have you ever been to the Channel Islands? Hello? Uh, hello, sorry, my microphone has done going to the wrong thing again oh well when, um uh, do you, do well, you want to sort back. You want, yeah you're back so have you ever been I'm to back. the channel islands i haven't but i really fancy it because it's supposed to be brilliant and i was you know to come back to where we started this conversation i did used to be a bit of a bergerac fan i i, I never liked those kind of dramas though i think they're all a bit boring but... yeah well we've had this discussion before you don't like a good you don't like a good detective, do you? Whereas I love it. How are you getting on with Line of Duty? I am almost at the end of series two. And I'm loving it. I shall be watching um, the final episode of series two after I finish this. Um, so, yeah, that's good. Um, by the way, you were talking about wiring just now. Let me tell you, do you want me to have a little rant about something? You know that I've ordered a new car. Do we, should we have a poll about that? Do we want Ian to have a rant? No, or Sean, don't we want is, Ian Sean is to going to do a, Sean is about to launch a poll about whether we um, should have sent the gunboats in. Oh, no, they weren't gunboats, were they? Um, oh, but you know, you know I've ordered a, well, a new they car. Were, they were ships with guns on them. Yeah. Yes, anyway, we know you've ordered a new car. Yes. Yeah. I'm not getting it till blooming September now, can you believe? So... My current car, which is also an Audi, I took in to have an oil change today. How much do you think an oil change costs at an Audi dealership? Oh, 200. 400 pounds. And then (gasps) what they do is they do a little video for you as if they're doing you a favour. And they send it to you. I love that. And it it gives you a little list of all the things that they think need to be done to your car because obviously they want to make a bit of extra money as well. So my back brake discs or brake pads or whatever they're called they um, are nearly out um a mere a mere 600 pounds the front brake discs they're not quite so bad but will need replacing within three months apparently over a thousand pounds 
And last year, and this is where I'm really, really hacked off, last year, um, they sent me an email saying, um, if you pay us £600, we can give you complete cover for your car for the next 12 months. So if anything goes wrong, um, you have to pay for it. I wasn't going to do it. But John said, oh, yeah, I think he should. So anyway, a little Page light. Page get a Mazda, by the way. Oh, fuck off. Page um, Boy says get a Mazda. I would not be seen <laughs> dead in a Mazda. Um, <laughs> yesterday a little light went on the dashboard and it was like of a video camera and I thought well I don't know what that means so I said to them can you have a look at that so they said well um they did have a look at it and it's something to do with the the, the wiring that goes to the ad blue so I said to them okay well that's presumably covered under the warranty that I paid 600 pounds for they come back while I was playing golf they rang John and <laughs> they said no it's not covered and he Miles said, oh, wants to know whether or not Miles wants to know if the Audi delivery is delayed due to problems at the border with paperwork. No, it isn't. I'm, I'm build week 34, <laughs> apparently. I think it... <laughs> so you are having a custom built car, as somebody else has pointed out. Yeah. What's wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with it. I just I'm starting along with the 99 other people on this uh, podcast, the world's smallest violin orchestra <laughs> whilst we listen to you we're on well anyway how terrible it is that your posh german car costs you a load of money john did john did a thing which i i have to say i would never do he said um i don't know if you know but my my partner's quite big on social media and he does have a policy that if he doesn't get good customer service he tells people about it um i mean he's got two hundred thousand followers on twitter so would you like to look into that warranty thing <laughs> I said, you didn't do that, did you? I said, I'd have just shouted at them. <laughs> it's the, don't, so, you, don't you know who I am? No, I've never done, I have, honestly, approach. I have never, ever done that. But I do, if I have a good customer service experience, I will talk about it on here. I'll talk about it on Twitter. But if I have a bad one, I will also do so. I've, I've had like 12 Audis. I'm, the, I'm a big, I think I'm a good ambassador for them. But if they try to do me over, which I think they're doing on this, I will tell the world about it as I just have. You know, in Alan Partridge, <laughs> he has a car with Alan Partridge <laughs> drives this car on the side of it. You should get Audi to give you a car with Ian Dale is driving this Audi on the side of it. And then people could write abuse on it like they do with <laughs> Alan Partridge. No, that's not going to happen. Um, anyway, we got sidetracked on that. Um, I think we should Indeed. go to questions because we don't um, want to outstay our welcome, do we? No, we don't. We've done, uh, to be fair to us, we've done a few as we've gone along, haven't we? Yeah. Um, yeah, and we've, yeah, yeah. We um, haven't completely ignored our listeners. Now, Sean's saying, I can't launch the poll because you launched the first one. Or, but, but there, <laughs> oh God, I don't know. Relaunch polling. Relaunch the polling with clear polling results. Continue. Oh, I don't know. This is too complicated for me. Um, so I'm going to not bother with it. Right, let's go on to questions. Now, um, the, the, the chat thing has really gone wild. So the, the chat thing really now just use for questions, if you could do. And we will then say who you are and we'll get Sean to unmute you. I don't know um, how long. Somebody who take. is an event manager says try poll two. Shall try I do it? Shall I read a question out whilst you're messing around with your polls? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, um, Oh no, we're going to. People are going to ask them themselves, aren't they, um, Sean? Uh, have you ch have you lined anybody up, Sean, or shall I choose somebody? Go go to Wayne McCormack. Yeah, Ma go to Mackie. Are you unmuted? Muting. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> So lovely, lovely to, see to see you. To you both, finally. How are you doing? You're All not a bit like what I thought you'd look like. He's quite. Oh, really? Is that good quite, or bad? I think I think he's quite hot. What do you think, Ian? I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Because right. it, be, it would be creepy. <laughs> but Ian, don't forget, last time we chatted on email, I was in a hot tub in Islamabad. Right? Oh yes, yes, you were. Yeah. No pictures though. No pictures, no pictures. But honestly, very, very quickly, thank you both so much for everything you've done seriously over the last year or so. Could you say that in the correct accent, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm stuck with a London accent, but people think it's a bit home counties, but it is actually genuine Cockney, uh, Cockney London, born at Barts Hospital. So, yeah, there we are. 
Um, but honestly, thank you so much. It's been a horrendous year for aviation. Um, so I can't tell you what you've done, particularly at two, three o'clock in the morning. So thank you. Bless you. It's our pleasure. Um, well, my question was, um, I probably emailed it to you, Ian, but what it was, last time I spoke to you, I was in a hot tub in Islamabad, quite literally listening to your podcast. So my question is, if you look at the current makeup of the House of Commons, and obviously assuming you are both single, which are not, but assuming you were, who would you like? To have Why would that make a difference? Well, because the question is, who would you like to have a debaucherous night in a hot tub in Islamabad with? So I've got three choices. My first one would be Jacob Rees-Mogg, simply because I'd like to see what he's like after a few drinks. Nothing political at all, I assure you. Um, second one would be David Lammy, because I think he'd be quite a laugh. And third one, uh, Dominic Raab for a bit of eye candy. What are your thoughts? You like, have you got the hots for Dominic Raab, Mackie? So, I mean, Jack, I'm your politi political persuasion, Jackie. I know you are. Um, I think he's quite... She's, she's never kissed a Tory, you see, Wayne. That's a... Not have I, not have I. Not, not yet, anyway. So. I've kissed you, Ian Dale. Indeed, on live on Sky News. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I think it was more me kissing you, actually. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no tongues, though. <laughs> yeah. So who would you choose out of the current makeup of the House of Commons? And you can't say Tony Blair, Jackie, because he's obviously, unfortunately, not there anymore. Anyway, I wouldn't want his mullet dangling in the in the hot tub. Oh. It wouldn't. It would not. Oh. That would not be good. Oh. Um. Well, uh, Johnny Mercer. Hmm. Um, Matt D is suggesting Wes Streeting for me. I yeah. couldn't yeah. possibly, I couldn't possibly comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> ben Bradley says Catherine um, says he's easily the most handsome MP. Uh, Mark Harper says Tom. Oh, Mark Harper's lovely. Yeah, well, we, we we have to say Mark because he's a regular listener yeah. as well. Um, Oh, sorry. Lynn, Liam says, sorry, it's Wizardora Street Slayer. That's uh, <laughs> worth his name. Talking of which, we have a delight for you because Oliver Turner is on the uh, podcast at the moment and he has sent me a new drag list. And I, I don't know, Oliver, if you want to um, give it yourself. That might be quite a novel way of doing this. Um, can we, uh, Wayne, thank you very much for your uh, contribution. Let's see if we can get... Um, Oliver Turner up uh, on the screen and in the meantime I've got some emailed questions here somewhere um, right this is from Q who says having reviewed Ian's Spotify what, like like in MI6 yeah apparently Ooh, right, okay. um, having reviewed Ian's Spotify playlists and what's Jackie on Strictly what do you think would be the perfect video for you to reenact a cheesy song with some idiosyncratic dancing I think something along the lines of can't touch this by MC Hammer <laughs> thank you for all you do but obviously don't please really do this um I Aim. think that yeah, fame, fame or I'm I've in had the time of my time. life. Is that Dirty Dancing? Is it from that? Yeah. So are you lifting me up and am I? Yeah. Yeah. And we, are we in the in the lake and I'm or jumping I, off the, the stage? I can't you? remember because I've never I don't think I've actually ever seen it. Have um, you never watched Dirty Dancing? No. <gasps> or you we could do um, the song from Top Gun. Um, what's it, up where we belong? Or we could do. You see, I was slightly less romantic. I was thinking something like, you know, Michael Jackson's Thriller video, or <laughs> <laughs> no, Kirsty Walk beat us to that. Um, now Oliver Turner is there with his lovely wife and lovely baby as well. Um, and again, oh. Oliver, you are not at all like what I thought you might look like. What a beautiful baby! What's the baby called? <laughs> Uh, this is Teddy. Um, <laughs> he should be in bed. Teddy should be in bed. He's not. Just, oh. <laughs> he should Hasht have ear defenders on. Hashtag yeah. Mordana has got a dog called I'll, Teddy. I'll, I'll exit now. <laughs> oh, he's gorgeous. Well now, done. Oliver, would you like to read out your latest missive? <laughs> go on. Go on. I will. I will. I will read them out. I'll just, I'll just get them up on here. That's, that's absolutely fine. 
Um, okay, so I've, I only had time to do two. Um, and uh, I started with the 45th president of the United States, um, who I've referred to as Donna Dump. Um, and the first thing about Donna is that she takes trans rights very seriously. Indeed, her favoured pronouns include me, me, and me. Um, she has several children, but only gets doe-eyed for one of them, the aptly named Iwanka. She also holds a soft spot for her favourite Brit, Nigella Massage. Um, <laughs> She, she unfortunately lost a major drag contest in 2020 um, and she whined about it for weeks and she refused to leave the stage. And, you know, in many ways, she's a bit of a Ramona. Um, <laughs> um, to her, her credit, she, she made history in 2018 when she shook hands with North Korea's most powerful drag queen, Kimberly Atomic. Um, and moving on to the 46th president of the United States, um, in, in 2020, Donna, Donna Dump was vanquished by Grandma Josephine, um, not to be confused with her namesake from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, of course. Um, it, this, this old bird's been a veteran since the 80s. She is deeply connected to the Pennsylvanian city of her childhood, Scrotum. And, and like many grannies before her, she's hit 78 and she just thinks, fuck it, let's get spending. <laughs> <laughs> and at some point I will introduce you to gorgeous Bush and Obama Rama. We, 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 look, we look forward we to that. We love those. Love Oliver, those. Thank you very much indeed. Now I have some good news for you, Jackie Smith. Um, Jackie Bailey has held on to Dumbarton. Very good. Which the SNP were expecting to win, I think. But there we are. Um, there have been some star Labour um, performers, actually, in Scotland. Jackie is one of them. And I have to say, Anna Sawa is doing a flipping brilliant job as well. I did an interview with him and I was really impressed with him, I have to say. He's actually seemed like a genuinely nice person he as is, well. Yeah, and yeah. I think what well, if people think of you as a nice person, you, you are kind of halfway there, aren't you? Yeah. They never thought yeah. that of you, obviously. <laughs> They do now. Lib Dems wiped should... out in Wales. Mm. That's presum I and presumably some of those votes have gone to Labour, have they? Um, I imagine so. Mm. Oh, Daniel Gray, hurtful. Is that why you never got elected, Ian? I mean Daniel. That's not what we expect, really, is it? <laughs> Remember that we are all about the kindness and the respect and the more in common. Yeah. Um, Noah Keat, let's get... I'm sure Noah Keat must have a question. Um, I, it's quite difficult oh. for me to keep flipping through the emails we've been given, and doing We've this. been given the rather attractive-looking Zachary James Stewart to have ask we? a question, though, haven't we? Sounds like yes. a character in Outlander. Oh, he's shouting, he's shouting, he's shouting. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. <laughs> come, come and watch me. <laughs> I just want all my family to, yeah, be quiet. <laughs> um, I'm up in uh, Scotland and uh, behind me I've got the results coming in, which we don't have many at the moment. But um, uh, I want to ask if the SNP do gain a majority, um, what kind of leg does Boris have? Do you think if he says no, not gonna, do you think it's then just going to further the cause of independence up here, which um, personally I'm not for, but... Um, I feel like if he turns around and says no, it's then just going to kind of ignite more of an independence yes vote. Hmm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because at the moment, all the polls are showing a decline in the uh, desire for independence. I mean, not I mean, it's marginal, but it's now under 50 percent, whereas yeah. it was up to 58 percent at one point. Um, my, my view has, has always been that if the SNP stand for these elections on the manifesto of having a referendum and they get a majority in the Scottish Parliament, to my mind, they've got a mandate to have the referendum. I think it's very, very difficult to say no in those circumstances. And it's, a, it's the political equivalent of martyrdom, isn't it? If, if you deny it, it just makes Nicola Sturgeon a martyr. And she says, look, these bloody English politicians, they're denying the Scottish people their right to have a referendum. And you'd have to say she would have a point on that. So if, if I were Boris Johnson, I would seriously consider saying, 
yeah, you can have it in three months and just yeah. have a quick, short, quick campaign. Make sure that the uh, pro-union campaign is a damn sight better than the Better Together campaign was last time, which was, I mean, it, it was it almost by luck that they won. Yeah, but it, it was not a good campaign. It was just done on Project Fear. We know then is Boris is Boris really the best prime minister at the yeah. moment to come up here and try and fight for yeah. independence? I just don't know if he polls very well up here in Scotland. I, I have a real I have a real problem, Zachary. That you know I don't I think David Cameron believed that holding a Brexit referendum uh, would get rid of the issue, and he never felt thought he would lose it. And you know what I think about. Brexit. So I am very opposed to holding a referendum when you can't live with the result. And I would be very, very sorry to see um, the end of the union. Uh, having said that, I think that it, it is, and actually, I don't think everybody, that what the polls seem to suggest is a vote for the SNP doesn't necessarily imply that you want independence. Perhaps Ian is right that the quickest way, that the way to do that is actually to call people's bluff and to say, okay, whilst we think it's possible to win that referendum, assuming that she gets a big enough majority, of course, we will we will go with that. But I'm very dubious about holding a referendum that you don't want to lose. And all even more whilst we're on the serious issues that the For The Many podcast enjoys, can I say, Zachary, that Alexandra Newlove says, Zachary, when you say family, do you mean parents or are you married? And Andrew Steadman says, Zachary can share my hot tub anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I did, yeah, I mean, my parents and my sisters, I'm, I'm not married. Oh, oh. <laughs> he's single, everybody. <laughs> You're batting, for, batting, batting for Ian's team. <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> I have a hot tub in Norfolk, by the way. Just saying. Stop it, Ian. <laughs> Well, you were only asking for your own nefarious purposes. I was asking for Alexandra, who's no, now very are. disappointed. We all, we all know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let's... Lovely to meet you, Zachary. Indeed. Um, let's get Joshua Powell as the next questioner. Um, and in the meantime, let's read out another... We've got Noah. We've got Noah first. Oh, have we? Okay, well... Yes. Why am I doing this then okay Noah well because you say it and it doesn't happen instantaneously I, know. I think I think I should just stay out of choosing questions and let Sean I, do it Sean is doing a brilliant job yeah. the lovely Sean who people remember from last time is doing a brilliant job producing essentially us this evening he is hello Brilliant. Noah. hello Jackie and hi lovely to be here and an uh, excellent show so far I've been trying to get for the many trending on Twitter sort of doing live commentary and um, I had some people commenting who haven't been able to make it tonight to uh, sort of intrigued as to what's going on by my commentary and I said they've got a treat when they uh, tune into the uh, episode tomorrow and then my tweets will make slightly more sense um, and so my question, it, it links to actually um, an email that I sent to Ian this morning at 6.49. So I was up very early. <laughs> to send it. Um, yeah, so, so was I, half past yeah, five. Yeah, yeah. yeah we so, thought we um, were going to be on the telly at that point, by yeah. the way, Noah. But we weren't. But we're no. over it. Oh, God. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dear. I got um, 90 seconds. Well, you have to you have to take every second you can get in the in this industry, I guess. Um, I'll read it out exactly as I sent it because I'm, I'm sort of slightly exhausted, which I'll explain why at the um, at the end of the email. So, uh, dear Ian and Jackie, firstly, uh, thanks for the shout out, Ian, on your podcast that you did with Steve Richards. So uh, you don't have to plug the All Talk podcast because I could I could do it for you. Um, I did I did tune into it. Still will. Um, I did tune into it and it was a, a great listen, very engaging, especially the parts about um, Esther Ranson and the, the Ant Fire, which sort of went in directions I wasn't quite expecting. Um, I said I was hugely excited about the For the Many after, after um, success of your debut live Zoom show in January, where I was unable to answer questions due to technical issues. So it's great that it's been um, resolved now. And uh, my question, it specifically re relates to the issue of um, expectation management, which clearly all parties and um, the Conservatives Labour engage in in every election. Um, but I'd be interested to know for both um, both yourselves outside of politics, when, when is a time that um, you've had to engage and sort of manage expectations in your personal and professional lives? Question mark, exclamation mark. Um, have a brilliant uh, Zoom show. Remember to enjoy yourselves and smile. And then I put in the PS for it um, if my email seems slightly incoherent. 
um, and if I seem sort of slightly incoherent now, it's because I spent 16 plus hours yesterday working as a pro clerk, which is a fascinating experience. Um, it shows you how exciting my life is. Um, but it did mean that I had to be uh, impartial on social media, which I found slightly tricky. Um, but it was a job. Where was that, Noah? Where were you doing it? Um, in Leamington. So I'm at uh, the University of Warwick, but live in Leamington. So I had to be sort of up at 4.40. So that was it. Yeah, 4.40 in the morning. And were you stopping people from voting if they didn't bring their own pencil or, or did you well, have we a were, we didn't have lots. We did have lots of pencils to give out, but then my poll clerk assistant has sort of got a tray for them to put their pencil in called uh, dirty pencils. So they put the, put the pencil in there, they don't get cleaned. It was sort of so sterile. There's so much hand sanitizer and everything, but it was all, yeah, very, very cautious and actually not a bad um, turnout and sort of really worthwhile experience and initially when I was there I thought I'll try and sort of predict in my head how I think they're going to vote but um, most of the time we actually got such a sort of flow of people especially in the afternoon that you sort of just forget to vote so you're relieved that you found them on the list and then you just have to get on to the next one but no I enjoyed it it was sort of a good way to be um, productively I guess procrastinating for my uh, university uh, exams which are forthcoming soon. Well Brilliant. I've not I think what dirty the pencil <laughs> Dirty yeah. Pencil could be the title of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, my pro clerk assistant was trying, to, yeah, was trying to make the experience more interesting. It did get a smile from people, so he, uh, he succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that you had an assistant. How old are you, 22? And no, I'm just 19. Well, so there you teenage, go. How old was the assistant, 13? 57, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically... We're all... Old- we yeah. all know a Keats assistants, for God's sake, Ian. You yeah. should know that by now. I thought he defected to Steve Richards' Rock and Roll podcast, but so I'm glad that he's he's back here now. Um, and just um, instead of plugging that, I'll plug the other podcast I've got out today, my book club podcast with the Reverend Richard Coles. Um, he's written a book called The Madness of Grief, all about the death of his partner through alcoholism. It's a brilliant read and it's a brilliant listen as well. So have, have a listen to that. Now, uh, what's your answer to Noah's question, which I've now forgotten? Managing experience expectations yeah in our per- in our personal lives um uh, I, think- <laughs> I think didn't when i went on strictly didn't i have a ready made justification for why i might well go out in the first week and it was still wholly legitimate i think i think i managed expectations around that yeah you, you well you were, you were hoping that you would exceed them though yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah I was. I know. Yeah. Um, I think I, when I first met John, I think I had to manage his his expectations <laughs> about my. Wait what, for what, it. Wait what? for it. <laughs> about my um, abilities to do household things. Oh God! I didn't know where we were going there. Really. <laughs> <laughs> It couldn't have taken him very long to realise that you are not, you're not housey-housey, are you? I mean, I'm not housey-housey, but I think you're probably even worse. You don't cook or anything. Well, I don't cook because I'm not allowed to, but I, I think I have told this tale before, so I won't bother about the, the first meal that I cooked for John. Um, and I've never cooked one since. I can, he, I can actually cook. I can tell our listeners that before we started, the lovely John came and checked Ian's background, decided that the plant that he had in the background was dead and needed to be removed (laughs) and brought those absolutely beautiful roses that are in the background of Ian's picture now. He did indeed. Now, John is very much a sort of home person. He's lived in Tunbridge Wells all of his life. And I keep trying to persuade him that we are going to move to Norfolk permanently, but never seems to happen. Um, And he, yeah. We are, you're we still are, going to be you're still going to be on the radio you're going to be like diddy david hamilton who we were talking about this morning who's had a rebirth through boom radio and you know you're going to be 90 and you're still going to be doing um your some radio show somewhere i can or another. assure you i'm not we're still going to be doing this podcast when we're 90 yeah i was thinking about this the other day about the day that we decide to finish it Oh, because well, I mean, at some point. Sorry, are I mean, you when... managing my expectations? What are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, quite. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, at some point, I mean, these things never go on forever, do they? Uh, well, actually, our podcasts usually do go on forever. That is, was, thought, that is true. I thought it was for better, for worse, till death us do part. 
You're not going well, to do this to that me. That may be you? what. Are you doing this to me live you? on the podcast? Are you dumping <laughs> no, me live no, on I'm the not podcast? Dumping you. I'm not dumping you because I would really miss it if we didn't do it anymore. Um, <laughs> somebody says, "Is uh, Claire Kerman says is Ian hinting he's replacing Jackie with Caroline Flynn? Well, what makes you think it would be me replacing Jackie? It could be Jackie replacing me with Caroline Flynn. With Caroline Flynn. <laughs> yeah, because it have to be an all women shortlist, wouldn't it? Well, it would make a nice change, wouldn't it, on radio and podcasts to actually have... Um, can a, we get... A, what? Sorry, get, are you interrupting me whilst no, I'm talking to, about I, having I, an all-female no, panel? No, I just want to get um, Sean to get Matthew Lambert for the next question. Carry on. What did you... Oh, no, I'd finished my point. <laughs> I'd finished my point. Um, typically, you see, being... Did you see that um, Khalid Mahmood has made a big... Um, thing uh, today despite the fact that apparently he actually resigned from the shadow cabinet a month ago uh but he's made this he's charge. never been in the shadow cabinet he's a junior the shadow front bench the shadow yeah. front bench um he's made this charge that um labor needs to move away from this focus on the metropolitan elite who are only interested in identity issues and technology or something oh so, californian technology um i mean you, you know i'm slightly anti a very london focus and i hope that my time in redditch gave me a bit of a feel for what people think outside london but i think that was an unfair charge that w- that he made Right. Well, let's um, talk to Matthew Lambert, who's there with Chris Goles, who is a colleague of mine on LBC. He presents um, on LBC uh, News and they are the most ridiculously good looking couple you've ever seen in your lives. I was just going to say, you don't have to. Everybody's going to be suffering enormous insecurities (laughs) because everybody we have had so far has been really gorgeous. And actually, we haven't had any women yet. So I think we need to find some women to ask some questions who will equally be gorgeous. Christopher tries at the weekend, so maybe... He tries... <laughs> <coughs> well, he, he becomes one of Oliver Turner's drag figures. This is my first sign. John Burko has a <laughs> microbe. That's my first sign. <laughs> anyway, my first question to you... Um, because we, you know, we split the household chores between ourselves, don't we? So, we try to, yeah. Yeah, we do. Um, what do you make a meal out of? Because if I'm, if I am listening to Christopher change the bedding, he base he sounds like he's mobilising two hundred thousand troops in the Gulf. Um, <laughs> what is your thing, and uh, what do you also make a meal out of? Let's be honest. In in terms of household chores. Yeah. Well, I don't really do any. No, he doesn't do any. What? <laughs> I mean, I, I said to John is, um, you know, when you, your duvet goes all sort of limp Ooh. and you want to sort of give it a good shake to get it back into shape. I don't know what it is, but when I do that, it just never comes out right. But when he does that, it's perfect. Um so I can't even shake a duvet properly, let alone change the duvet cover. That takes me hours. It's a nightmare. I've yeah. got a little bit, I've got a bit of a dust allergy, which is why I can't do any cleaning, Gov. <laughs> um, so if I do a lot of dusting, which I have to say does not happen very often, then I will make a bit of a meal of sort of <coughs> and being a bit sort of sneezy and everything. So let that be a lesson to everybody. Housework is positively dangerous and you never know what you might catch. And of course, the other problem is you do the housework and then six months later, you've got to do it all again. So what is the point? Six months later. (laughs) Yeah, that was the joke, Ian. Oh, right. Okay. (laughs) Um, I, when I'm alone in Norfolk, uh, I, on a Monday morning before I drive back down to London, I will do the washing up, mainly because I have no idea how the dishwasher works. <laughs> <laughs> because you've basically stacked it up in the sink all over the weekend whilst you've been there, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's true. Um, Sean, have we got some women to ask some questions? 
Mary Hunt, you look as if you could ask a good question. Would you like to ask a question, Mary? We have Sorry. Hannah. We have <laughs> Hannah first. Okay. Hi, Hello. Hannah. So this is such a lovely evening. Thank you, guys. It does feel like one big for the many family. I love it. Thank you. And um, now I'm going to bring the smut level up to a crescendo. Oh and I'm going to go... A peak! A climax! The... <laughs> exactly. A climax! Exactly. Well, Excellent. a climax is, is quite fitting, Jackie. So I'm going to go with the old classic, shag, marry, avoid. Yes. <laughs> okay, so Jackie, they're not of our political persuasion, so it's mm. going to be probably more challenging for you. Mm -hmm. but I'm going to put four, three candidates forward. So to kick us off, we've got Ed Balls, mm -hmm. David Cameron, mm -hmm. or John Burko. Mm -hmm. Ed Balls is of my political persuasion. Oh, sorry, of course, yeah. Sorry, yeah. apart from Ed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ed, David Cameron, and Burko. And Burko. I'm going to. I'm going to shag David Cameron because <laughs> he does. You know, it's very good at lobbying. You He'd nag you, nag would. you until you did it. Not I'm going to. Oh, sorry. I'm All right. Going. Okay. I would, in this hypothetical situation, yeah. I would shag David Cameron. I would marry Ed Balls, very good cook. Yeah. And I would avoid John Burko. Who said that? Someone just down there. It didn't. It didn't. Yeah. Where did they say? What? <laughs> I, th I think Ma Matthew and Chris are still on. <laughs> <laughs> what did they just say? I don't know. I didn't hear it. <laughs> I have to listen back to the podcast now. <laughs> Was it something very bad? <laughs> um, right. Is, is that all, Hannah? Or are no, you you've got to do. You've got yeah, to you've say. Got to answer, Ian. Got to oh, answer, the same Ian. one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I would probably say the same. I would definitely avoid John Burko. It's a bit of a toss up, if you forgive me, forgive the, <laughs> between David and Cameron and Ed Balls. But David Cameron, I think, though he's very smooth, isn't he? I'm not sure that I kind of. Mm. What do you like it a bit? What, what are you saying, Ian? Well, I've, uh, do you remember those pictures of him in the sea in Cornwall? It, it didn't. It doesn't. That doesn't do it for me. What you you want some body hair? Well, I just he looked like a bit of whale blubber. <laughs> So actually, maybe maybe I'd marry him instead because if you if you're married, you don't have to shag, do you? So um, I think, uh, yeah, I think Ed Balls is the lucky guy. <laughs> actually, I've got an anecdote about Ed Balls, which I reminded him of the other day. I was doing a um, thing for City University with Barney Jones, who used to be the editor of Andrew Marr. He's now a professor there, and they do they do a um, every year. I do a little talk about what it's like being in the broadcast media. And Ed Balls was on after me, and it was all done on Zoom. And I reminded him of You were Ed time. Balls fluffer. I was, I, in fact, I think <laughs> I said that. Um, I reminded him of the time he was doing a phone in with me in our backup studio at LBC, which is quite small. And um, it was, I can't remember what he had said the previous week, but whatever it was, we, we put it to, the tune of Je t'aime. And so he was sort of saying things. And what, what he, of course, had forgotten was that the cameras were on. So we were playing this sort of two minute montage of Ed Ball's greatest hits with Je t'aime. Uh, exactly. And he, he was loving it. And he'd forgotten that the cameras were on and he kept making rude signs. <laughs> like what? I couldn't possibly say. Um, you can't tell that story and not do the sign. Well, the, the other one, Chukka Amuna did the same thing once. We didn't have Jotem, but we, he was, um, it was when he was seen as a rising star in the Labour Party. And um, I did a phone in on some random subject. I can't remember what it was, but it wasn't to do with party politics. And somebody phoned in and said, well, if Chukka Amuna was leader of the Labour Party, I'd vote Labour. And then the switchboard lit up. And like the rest of the calls in the hour were everybody say, yeah, if Chukka was leader, I'd vote Labour. And this is when Ed Miliband was having a really tough time. And so, of course, the next time he was on, we put some of these calls together and just did like a minute and a half montage. And I mean, we all know that Chukka loves himself quite a lot. He was the cat that got the cream. And of course, he'd forgotten that the cameras were on as well. 
Um, but all politicians have egos, don't they, Jackie? I was going to actually say all politicians have egos. When you can't take my defense of politicians is you can't really take all of that flack unless you've got a reasonable sense of self. Let's put it like that. Indeed. Right. Um, Hannah, thank you for that. Um, Joshua Powell is next. Hello, Joshua. Hello. Thank you for having me on. Not at all. OK, Lovely right. To see you, so my question, thank you. Yeah. Uh, right. So my question is, uh, I sent this to uh, Ian earlier. Have either of you ever had the awkward experience of bumping into someone high profiled or just someone that you know in your like, personal lives and, uh, well, you haven't actually known them and that they ask you a lot of questions and you haven't got the foggiest of who they are um, or has the opposite happened? You've spoken to someone else, yet they don't know who you are. That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I have encountered people who've come up to me and said, oh, hi, and great to see you again. And I'm thinking, I don't even recognise your face. I don't know who you are. And it is, I, I like to think I carry it off and sort of don't let on that I don't know. Who. Although there was someone not that long ago, I just said, literally was honest. And I said, oh, I'm really sorry. I don't, can you just remind me? And it, it actually wasn't as embarrassing as I thought it would be. But I'm trying to think of a, 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 a famous person. Rather the, op, op, the very, one of the very first times I was ever in the chamber of the House of Commons in the good old days, it used to be crammed in there. I, and this is sort of the opposite of what you're asking me. I actually stepped back onto somebody's foot, turned round and was face to face with John Major. And I'd never seen him in the flesh before and that was quite a sort of like whoop. Edwina but off, off, well I off. did I did think to myself I can slightly see what Edwina saw in him at that, at that point um but I actually had a situation only about a week or so ago when I was out um with Paige Freeboy and uh, we were in you know sitting outside in a cafe and as we got up to go um we were having a chat with two people that sitting at the table next door and one of them did that thing that is really really difficult and she said don't I know you? And of course you can't, the problem with that is you don't know, if you just sort of say, oh yes, I'm enormously famous and a celebrity, then that makes you sound like a bit of a tit. Um, so I sort of all went, oh, <laughs> and then I said, well, um, I have been on the telly uh, most recently in Strictly and I was a politician. Her response was, oh yeah, you went out in the first week, didn't you? <laughs> Oh, I thought you'd say her response was, was, oh, are you Anne Widdicombe? No, <laughs> <laughs> that was better than the person, I've told this story before, when I went to, to um, what's the word, clock into a hotel and said to the reception, the receptionist said, oh, what's your name? And I said, it's Smith. And she said, I bet you're pleased you're not that one, aren't you? <laughs> this was quite soon after I stepped down government. And then she looked up and realised who I was. And then there was this very British, slightly sort of <coughs> awkward, <laughs> moving on thing that happened. Right, Joshua, thank you for that. Um, we have Mike and, well, it just says Shah on my screen, but I assume that's Mike and Sharon. Sharon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, just like to ask, um, Jackie do, Annie, and do you think you have to be clever, uh, intelligent to be PM? Because with all the advisors around you and the team, are you just sort of front of house, sort of page three glamour person? Or is, is there an element of intelligence there? <laughs> I, I love Boris, I, I, you know, Gray, but is it all stuff and nonsense because and it, of the advisors? And it's not a loaded question at all, is it? <laughs> um, D Daniel Gray <laughs> says, are these two in Benidorm or something? <laughs> no, we're, we're, in our, we're in our pub in our garden. Um, little sign up there saying hello where, where are you there where, where you own is this do you own this pub or are you it's, it's a pub garden shed. shed it's our garden shed oh how fantastic <laughs> that's my son <laughs> so we just it was a bit of a lockdown right. sort of keep keep there's this the one snacks. Clean, there's the snacks <laughs> that looks that looks absolutely <laughs> lovely so have you the just built that during lockdown yes yeah yeah um it was a um, something that we'd wanted to just have a little fun 
thing in the garden, you know, it's a oh, little fun thing, but in the garden. And uh, so we did it in lockdown. Yeah, but we had the nice weather. That is amazing. I, I, could, I couldn't even make a banana it? bread and you've built a... <laughs> that is that is great. Well, right, we're going up to visit Ian. I mean, I mean, Chester, you, come to Chester. I mean, have, I've, it, has, it has turned us in, into alcoholics. To be we are. Honest, we but, have put uh, four yeah. stone on and we're now alcoholics. Actually, I'm planning to come to Chester. A friend of mine lives near, in Mould. That's near Chester, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah, it's about yeah. Quarter, 10 minutes, quarter of an Somebody, hour away. Yeah, well, I might, be come, I might be paying a visit soon. There you go. Very welcome. Come, come to our pub. Come to Weatherspooners. Right, now, what was the question? Jen, I <laughs> oh, that's good. I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so do you have to be intelligent? You think because of all the advisors, you can get away with just being the voice box, the front man, the page I three. I think you've got, you've got to have some basic intelligence. I mean, I can't think of a prime minister in recent memory who you would say was thick. Um, can you, Jack? No, obviously, I go, I go more, I go stronger than that. I don't, I think you do have to be clever to be prime minister. Mm. Um, and you cannot, as prime minister, a lot of the time you have to really respond quickly and you have to have good judgment <laughs> And obviously you have to be able to absorb an enormous amount of information in order to inform that, that judgment. You cannot depend on advisors to do that. If you haven't got it, all the advice in the world, important though that is, is not going to make you a good person. So maybe more stuff. streetwise or, or actual intelligence? I think it's judgment and intelligence mm. combined. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Noah, Noah says, and to find out more about prime ministers, why not buy Ian's book? <laughs> is I he mean, on commission? We, bless him. Well, well done, no. We're coming on to that. Yeah. <laughs> is he on commission? Bless him. <laughs> Look, I mean, often uh, in the end, the buck stops with the prime minister, and the prime minister has to have good judgment. Now, intelligence is part of that. Um, I think empathy is a bit is another part of that. Leadership is another part of that. Uh, there are very few prime ministers who've got all of the um qualities that we would want to have in a prime minister um jackie obviously would say that tony blair had all of those qualities i would naturally say that margaret thatcher did as well and and i mean great prime ministers probably yeah, do um, have most of i mean it look you need to be the prime minister at the right time and sometimes mm. i mean gordon brown i'm afraid in a sense he was the prime minister at the right time in dealing with the financial crisis but he was quite unlucky that it happened in his period in office jim <laughs> Callahan, who he'd been home secretary chancellor foreign secretary on paper had everything needed to be a good prime minister but again he was in the wrong place at the wrong time he was at <laughs> the fag end of a government it was the economy was going to pot uh, strikes and he just never could get a total grip of things I, th um, I think we, we were always a little, little bit suspicious of David Cameron, for example, because of his sort of PR sheen. Yeah, but he, David He's Cameron... Quite clever, made, he, he yeah, was clever, though. He was yeah. clever, and I think he had some quite good instincts um, in many ways. But um, it's like I say in all the interviews I do on this book, that... Each prime minister is remembered for one thing. Well, hey, guess what he's going to be remembered for? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it goes all well, yeah. history might be written up in a very different way to uh, if it all goes to pot, as Jackie imagines it, it, it will. Anyway, back to the smut. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Thank you. <laughs> um, We've been going over two hours, Ian. I know. We have actually lost many people, you know. So how how many people want us to carry on for a bit and how many thumbs up if you want us to carry on well, thumbs down if you think no we're bored now Yeah that that was that that's a bit like saying oh no you didn't <laughs> Right everyone's saying yes on the chat okay well let's go on uh, or, or have you got a, have you got a hot date Jackie Um no all right okay Um Claire Brokenshire is there. Claire, have you got a question for us? You, you've appeared in a slightly random position. We got I'm... Judith. Have we? we got Judith first. Okay. No, yeah, we've got no, Judith Claire hasn't got one. Yep. Let's go to Judith then. Hi. Hello. Um, Hi, Judith. Think, hello, hello from Sedgefield Constituency, an interesting place to be today. <gasps> Why I? Yes, exactly. Um, I asked a couple of questions, but I think the one that I'm going to ask is, out of the current crop of, M crop of MPs, who would you want to be your James or Jane Bond? And who would be their sidekick or their love interest? Ooh. 
Dr. Luke Evans, I think, looks a bit like a James Bond. Um, you can all Google him. He's probably one of the best looking MPs in the House of Commons. Not a lot of competition. You've talked for that, about actually. him before. I have talked about him before. You've talked about him before, Ian. You've got a yeah. bit of a thing for him, haven't you? Yeah, I've never interviewed him. Um, uh, oh, dear. You see, you get people have the idea that we, we're sitting around, you know, as political commentators, we're sitting around with a bunch of photographs going, oh, he's a bit of all right, or she's a bit of all right. Well, I did do, back um, in the day when I did my blog, which you remember so fondly, Jackie, um, I did a top 20 best looking politicians and top 20 best looking journalists. No. I Can I just say, Sky used to do that and I was in it. Were you? Hmm. You're better looking. I was in it at the height of my... At the, uh, was that in it at the height of my difficulties? I think it was a bit like a sort of sympathy shag. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> never. Have you ever done a sympathy shag? <laughs> <laughs> you have, haven't you? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, we've all done it. Been about you've been around more than I have, Ian. So um, I don't know about that. I started very late in life, if you remember. Oh yeah, yeah, true. Anyway, let's get back to Judith's question. Um, No, because I couldn't, I couldn't, I can't think of any. Um, Peter Kyle. Oh I don't yes. Think, I don't think oh, that he's a, a Jackie's persuasion. If you get my drift. No, no I know, but. but... We're but not he, bothered. We're just asking who's going to be James Bond. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's true. Sorry, I thought, we were, talking about, I thought we were talking Bond, about sympathy actually. shacks. <laughs> Crikey, I wasn't going into that. <laughs> Peter Peter would be an amazing Actually, James you're Bond. right. And he shares an office, of course, with Wes. So they could be like a sort of double. Wes and Peter Kyle could be like a fabulous James Ooh, Bond pairing. A, a Wes and Peter sandwich. <laughs> um, if you're listening Wes they're our friends we're allowed to say it I'm not joking I'm serious <laughs> <laughs> thank right. you Judith um, who should we have um, Faz is shocked going, Ian that's often what my producer says <laughs> Kat who is now obviously she's the editor of this podcast but has moved on from my show uh, this week um, often on the radio, if I say something a bit off colour, I just get her saying in my ear, Ian! She wasn't on the other... We were doing a, a <laughs> phone-in last night on... Um, there was a survey out about the number of 16 or 17-year-olds that had seen pornography. Was, I can't remember what the figures were. It's quite high. So we did a we did a phone-in on... If you're a parent and you discover your child looking at porn or addicted to porn... What do you do? Now, obviously, with a phone in like that, it can go a bit wrong sometimes. And I think we just about stayed on, on the tightrope. But there was a tweet which I did read out, which possibly I shouldn't have done. And it was from somebody called Simon, who said something along these lines. He said, um, I, I was very frustrated when I realised that after watching porn, that my expectations that a plumber would arrive on time were totally wrong. <laughs> It was funny the way he did it, but anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, Ed Ray, you have a question. Yes, hello. Uh, hello. It's lovely to be with you both. Ah, a bit nervous. Um, yeah, the podcast means an awful lot to me. It sort of burrowed its way into my heart very oh, quickly. Um, so it's wonderful. Um, so I'll get on with my question, um, but love to you both. Um, if have you been asked to do celebrity goggle box if not why not and if you were to do it what three tv shows would you most like to watch with each other we have had this question before the first part of it and of course we're killed to do celebrity goggle box or indeed any form of goggle box and in, in some ways what we're doing at the moment is a form of that isn't it because i'm i've got like 25 of you on my screen and I can sort of flick through different screens. In fact, I think I, I might do and just have a little bit of a different view. Um, what, what shows would we review together, Jackie? 
We would love to do it. We we have we keep basically, you know, we could not have been more blatant about saying no, that we'd like and, to do it. And somebody on so, Twitter um, was recommending us to the editor of Gogglebox, but um, has there been any got contact? Ignored. No, there hasn't. No. Um, Lawrence Fox does celebrity goggle box for goodness sake if he can do it we can do that's it. ridiculous I'd love to see you do line of duty at first dates because of all the fabulous relationship advice yeah, I quite like that. and the news as well just sort of politics stuff um or I naked, watch, naked yeah we attraction. could do prime minister's questions or I watched naked attraction for the Did first you? time ever this week Ian yes <laughs> which one was it's it it's awful <laughs> it's vile isn't it it was one where they were it's absolutely dreadful and i didn't realize that so it was a woman choosing these men and i turned on at the point where it was just above the waist <laughs> so i was doing that sort of peering at my tv trying to work out what what everybody had and then i obviously they go up to the face don't they and then they speak yeah she chose the wrong one basically then she's naked herself which was weird um, they're both naked and then they go off don't they and have this yeah. date and obviously they did the business but then she's sitting on this sofa at the end they very rarely do actually he hasn't turned up they very rarely do the business oh no I think I saw that one too oh, well, was, probably... was, was it um, yeah. yeah no I think I did see that one and she's sitting there on the sofa and the producer says to her, I'm very sorry, but Fred or whatever his name was, uh, we keep phoning him, but he isn't taking our calls, so he isn't going to turn up. And, I, and she was really cross. And I thought, that's awful. But I suppose she put herself... I mean, she, she'd been naked on telly, so not much worse could have happened, really, could it? Um, Daniel, who is a little minx, judging by the comments that he's leaving in the chat box... He maybe, is, isn't he? Maybe you could both go on Naked Attraction if Gogglebox won't, have you? Well, if they wanted their ratings... I have comment. got better boobs than the woman that was on that I saw. That's all I'm I saying. I endorse that message. Not that I would know, obviously. <laughs> Um, did you see the? Oh my God! Mike and Sharon say, "Did you see the one with the church-going lady on it?" Did I hell? I mean, honestly, I could not believe that woman. She was like literally a. Uh, nor can you, Mike or Sharon, can you? I remember that will be seared on my mind. She was a woman of a certain age. Um, yeah, and she was basic, very blatant and. Uh, I, but what what do you think Jackie, what do you mean by very blatant do you think are you suggesting that women of a certain age can't well it was just a bit uncomfortable and uh, maybe maybe people find us uncomfortable when we talk about these things but she was just Some saying people do. she was saying things that <laughs> oh she was going on about girth apparently yes say, she was mike yes. and sharon yeah she was mm. And if and were we not doing this face to face, I'd probably follow up on that. <laughs> but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, right. right. <laughs> Do we have anybody? Gin and tonic yet? Oh, and I've lost my speaker again. We'll get your speaker speaker back. Um, let me do a couple of other. Um, uh, email questions. Um, can we get Sarah Mori up on the uh, on the Zoom thingy, and maybe then um, Detto Det Detto Riley or Det O'Reilly? I don't know what um, whoever. Um, and let me just read this one out from Nikki Beaumont. Um, yesterday, Just Phillips trolled Lawrence Fox on Twitter saying his theatre performances and acting was incredibly crap and dreadful. Have you or Jackie ever been criticised or trolled over a bad performance, <laughs> political or otherwise? Um, I'm trolled every day. It doesn't matter. I can do the most brilliant interview of my career and I will still get trolled for it by somebody who thinks I've asked a question that I shouldn't have. Um, yeah. Well, um... I thought I escaped, um, for example, on Strictly, I thought I escaped um, quite a lot of horrible trolling, partly because I just block people if they want to be um, horrible. Uh, and sometimes we even get criticism for our appearances on Good Morning Britain or for the podcast, less the podcast, because people have got a choice really about whether or not they want to uh, subscribe. I think if you... Um, 
you know, obviously one of the things that we try to do on this podcast is to, as I suggested earlier, is to sort of demonstrate that it's perfectly possible to disagree, have a laugh, um, be smutty, uh, be passionate about things without having to take other people down or be horrible. And I hope that that's one thing that we that we managed to do. I, um, therefore, I've got not much patience for people that are gratuitously horrible. I now will just block anybody who says something nasty, frankly, because life's too short to engage in that horribleness. Um, Jack Sharman also has got a good question, but let's go to Sarah. Is it Sarah or Sarah Mori? Oh, we need to unmute, unmute you. Unmute yep, great. You. Um, it's Sarah, spelt Sorry, Sarah. Sarah. Um, thank you for having me on and uh, very nice to speak to you both. My question was, um, in the 80s, I worked in a bank in Westminster and a regular visitor to the branch was Dennis Thatcher. And at the time he had a lot of negative press um, and been given a, a hard time. And every time he came into the bank, he was an absolute sweetie and was so such a gentleman, so nice. Uh, and lovely. So my question to you both was, um, who can you remember uh, being surprised at when you met them that, you know, the, the, pre the idea you had, the preconception, uh, conceived idea was totally different to how they came across in a good way, so that you were, you know, surprised at, at, at the kind of total contrast? I think I'd say Jackie Smith. <laughs> Um, I'd also say Chris Bryant, who I, before I met him, I'd always regarded as one of these awful politicians who's just so tribal, they could never see any good in the other side, which is odd given that he started out as a conservative, but I really didn't like him at all. Um, but I, I then met him and realized that I was wrong. He's actually a re he's really good company, a really good laugh. He's actually quite self-deprecating as well. So he, he's somebody that I, I completely changed my mind over. Mm -hmm. um, Ian, Ian um, likes to suggest that I don't uh, get on with David Davis. And uh, politically, I obviously don't get on with him. And a lot of his job when I was Home Secretary was to try to sort of get me sacked. But on a personal level, I've actually always found him to be um, sort of quite kind and um, funny and nice. So um, he, he might be one person. And I think your po it's interesting, your point about um, Dennis Thatcher I've, been, I've thought a bit in recent weeks about um, what a totally shit job it is to be the partner, wife or husband of the prime minister. And, um, you know, they are in a really impossible position because they are damned uh, in relation to their partners. In the case of Carrie, I think she's taken some criticism that is wholly unfair and she's not in a position to defend herself. Cherie obviously took a load of nonsense from, from people and all they are trying to do is to support their partners in doing a really, really hard job. And I think uh, they are generally pretty misunderstood and, and should get a lot more gratitude than they get. Totally agree with that. Dennis Thatcher um, was a, I mean, also a great company. I remember a dinner that I sat next to him at once, had Margaret Thatcher on one side and Dennis Thatcher on the other. Um, he couldn't wait to get a cigarette out after all the food. Um, he drank like a fish, was completely pissed <laughs> by the end of the meal and uh, was hugely entertaining. And uh, it, was, it was a great night, actually. Um, Deirdre is with us. Deirdre, what would you like to ask? Deirdre Brackets hasn't been to hairdressers yet. It looks lovely, Deirdre. It looks cool. <laughs> Can you unmute Deirdre? Uh, I've done it. Done it. Unmute right. it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a funny evening. And uh, Jackie, you can't see the back of my head. Um, so my question is... Gesundheit, Claire. Reincarnation was a thing, was real. What well-known person would you like to have been in the past life? And who, example, a home secretary, or what would you like to be in a future life? 
Oh. I um, wanted to be Elizabeth I in a previous life. What, virgin? As a sort of... <laughs> Born with, again virgin. A virgin with wooden teeth. Do you think she was a virgin, though? Well, how would I know? <laughs> <laughs> people I mean, have she, written people If she had wooden teeth, PhD I suspect teeth. she might have been. She didn't have wooden teeth to begin she, with. She only had wooden teeth towards the end. She didn't have wooden teeth throughout the whole of her life, you know, did she? No, that's true, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just think in those, you know, access to hey. NHS dentists was not quite so good in Elizabethan times. And why would you want to be Elizabeth I, the most because powerful like, woman in the world? You, you're just power crazy, uh, aren't you? I am. Why, why <laughs> would I not want to be a powerful woman? I, I do want to. And who do I want to come back? Is, it was the, Deirdre, was the rest of the question, who do I want to come back? Yeah, as? you can come back as either, a, like a per. obviously you can't be a person because you don't know who, but as a person, as in a home secretary, or as an animal or, you know, whatever. So maybe president of America, something like that. You <laughs> sound completely power crazed now. <laughs> I was thinking I'd quite like to come back as a fish. Oh, that's sort of like peace. Pretty like peace. drinking. Oh dear. Very unimaginative. Oh, More, probably a shark. Um, <laughs> I would like to... Um, who would I like to be? I, I, I did write once that if I could be anybody of the present age, I'd quite like to be Alastair Campbell, which everyone thinks is lunatic. But um, Alastair is... I, I'm reading his latest volume of diaries at the moment which are absolutely emotional he talks a lot about his son who has been an alcoholic and the the, the breakdown of their relationship and he, and he spends a lot of time crying which you can't imagine a sort of like because he's quite a macho guy Alastair Campbell in, in many ways you can't imagine him crying but I've read all of his other volumes and I, I sort of know him a bit he really helped me um on the my brighton beach episode back in 2013 he's someone if you were going to go tiger hunting you'd want him uh, beside you so i have a lot of time for alistair campbell in terms of who i'd like to be reincarnated as well this question came up at a, and i think i might have told this on a previous episode but a couple of years ago this epi this came up as a question at a parliamentary selection i did in 2003 in beverly Jackie knows what's coming here, I think. Um, and I, I answered the question that I would like to come back as my Jack Russell Geo because he's loved by everyone and has no responsibility and has a life of Riley. And it turned out there were quite a few Jack Russell owners in the audience, so that went down quite well. Um, one of my competitors, who subsequently became MP for another seat, um, his reply to that question, who or what would you like to come back as, he said, I'd like to come back as Kylie Minogue's bicycle saddle. <laughs> this, is a, this is somebody who served as a minister in David Cameron's government and is a current M I think he's still I think he's still an MP. <laughs> he didn't get selected for that one though. <laughs> Alistair Campbell, of course, is going to be doing Good Morning Britain in um next yeah, week. Yeah, and but not on Friday. An that's another way, Ian, that you could follow in the footsteps of Alistair Campbell. There is a big big push on Twitter for you to be on the <laughs> what, Good four Morning people? Britain. <laughs> I, I, I saw a couple at least. No, no, no. See, I, think... <laughs> I think we all know that's not going to happen. More's the pity. Well, I keep saying I don't actually particularly enjoy television. And if I never did television again, it wouldn't bother me at all. Um, apart from, oop. Apart from doing Good Morning Britain with you, obviously, but I don't, I don't yeah. just don't enjoy it as much as I do um, radio. So there's been a big growth in uh, radio and a big growth in podcasting as well. I think through the pandemic, and that's hopefully one of the things that we'll be able to keep as we come into a more normal life afterwards. Now, have we got Jack Sharman, and can we get Jason? um on as well uh, because he's got he's got quite a good question uh, jack there you are 
Um, what would you like to ask us? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yep. That's great. Sexy voice. Sexy voice. Jack. <laughs> yeah, I got told I should be like a documentary narrator or something by a teacher once. Mm. So. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted eight, to ask eight, you. Nine, eight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted I wanted to ask you because it's a Friday night and I'm obviously gladly forfeited uh you know going out for you guys tonight um what your favorite drunken memory as a student was <laughs> I was featured this was this was a sign of things to come I was featured in the daily mail because I was at university um the same university and at the same time as some of the sort of peak years of the Bullingdon Club. And I had a good friend who decided that actually the men shouldn't have all of the fun. I mean, I actually hated the Bullingdon Club even then, but she uh, put together a drinking stroke dining society called the Helen Club, of which I was a member. And um, rather infamously, we returned to our college after a night out and went into the library and started dancing on the tables and got caught by the librarian or rather we didn't get caught because we ran away and hid um but the librarian was pretty sure about who some of the leading people were and we actually had to go up I mean bloody hell I was what 19 or something I wasn't still at school we had to go up in front of the dean the next day and were asked who else was involved and we basically sort of you know refused to give away our, um, our colleagues. I ain't no grass. <laughs> exactly you're not getting anything out of me. So, so obviously I'm deeply ashamed of that and yeah. I and you know young people just say no when it comes to getting drunk. Um, in the, at the beginning of my second year so I would have been because I had a gap year I would have been what 19 maybe gap 20. Year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I, my, I had a new friend called Tim, who subsequently became my best friend. And um, at that point, I had never been drunk. I didn't really like alcohol at all. So he said, right, we're going out tonight and we're going to get you drunk. So we went to a nightclub in Anglia Square in Norwich, um, which was called, I think, was it Rick's Place? Something like that, anyway. That's Casablanca. No, it wasn't Casablanca. Oh, I see what you mean. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the only alcohol, alcoholic drink I actually liked was Perno and Blackcurrant. Bear in mind, I am from Essex. And um, so I kept drinking these Perno and Blackcurrants and I got to 11 and I was completely gone. And there was this girl in my um, German group who, should we say was not the best looker but and I knew had always fancied me and anyway she got me onto the dance floor and a smoochy one came on and she started snog I mean really snogging me and I just sort of thought I'm going to be sick in a minute so I said I've, I've got to go and anyway I said to Tim we need to go you know and I really was very very drunk and I remember on the on the way out um we encountered the captain of the UEA rugby club, who Tim knew. And I just remember in a very slurry way saying, do you come here often? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then we got out onto the street and Tim had ordered a cab and it was a Fiat Uno, I think. And I said, I'm not getting into an Italian car. I want a British car. So we had to get a British car. We got back to the residences and I lived in, I don't know if you, any of you know about UEA, the, the sort of ziggurat, like pyramid student residences. I lived in Norfolk Terrace. And um, actually, no, I didn't in that year. I lived at... Anyway, well, it doesn't... The detail doesn't get really on matter. with it! Um, and, <laughs> and I just remember puking up um, for a protracted period of time in one of the loos. And it was all sort of black currenty colour. And it stained the loo for three weeks. So imagine what Perno and black, do, black does to your stomach if it, if it does that to a loo. And that was my first ever drunken experience. 
The another one is uh, I used to um, have a flat in Docklands. Um, this is about 1995, and I had a party, and my sister came. And some for some reason in the flat, they, there were two bathrooms, and they were like next to each other, which is a bit weird. And it turned out, as I discovered later, that uh, as I was puking up in one toilet, she was puking up like sort of two feet away from me in the next door toilet. Families, eh? So close. <laughs> yes. Um, Jason, thank you very much, Jack. Jason is there with his question. Hello, Jason. Can we unmute Jason? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Um, Jackie and Ian, in light of the uh, restaurants reopening in London uh, in 10 days' time, indoors anyway, I was wondering, um, what are your favourite London restaurants? And on that subject, I was wondering if Jackie had ever been taken up the Oxo Tower. I can probably recommend it. Oh, or the Shard. <laughs> or the Shard, yeah. Oh dear, thank you for that, Jason. Nice beard. Um, I like the ivy. Um, I didn't go out. Um, I didn't go out that much to to restaurants. I have been to Claridge's. I was dined at Claridge's by a newspaper. That was quite nice. Um, yeah. And my my and the, sorry. Go on, Ian, sorry. Um, my favourite restaurant is the Delaunay, which is on Aldwych, opposite where the BBC World Service used to be. And it, it's the sister restaurant to the Wolsey, which I don't like. Um, but it's got a slightly Germanic menu, which um, I love I love German Didn't food. Did you take me to breakfast at the Wolsey? Did I? Was it you or was it somebody else? When we were coming to do a podcast after having done Good Morning Britain, we went for breakfast, didn't we? Oh, yeah, we did. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Very nice, uh, it was. Yeah. Oh, it's nice food. I find it very loud. I don't like loud restaurants. The other one that I really used to like was the Texas Embassy on um, just off Trafalgar Square, um, but that isn't there anymore, unfortunately. I love I, I love Mexican food. Um, oh, I'm I'm being. Are you coming to tell me my dinner's ready? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> what have, have we got? You have been going on for two and a half hours. Chicken and peppers, excellent. That's nice. And and is Jackie going to answer the, the um, supplementary question? What was the have I been ever? <laughs> Jack, answers, uh, sorry, the Jason. The answer is really, no, Jason. Really, well, you didn't. You shouldn't have even <laughs> gone there. Honestly, I'm not going to answer that question. But I think we all know the answer. <laughs> and on that high note, I think it's time. <laughs> That we uh, wrap this up, don't you? We've we've only we've lost about twenty percent of the uh, uh, audience, but it, we have been going for two and a half hours, which does make this officially, I think, the longest ever for the many podcast, even surpassing that excellent one with Caroline Flint. Um, but there will be an extra for the many podcast on Monday, a normal style. Um, I apologise to anybody who has been listening to this who hasn't actually been taking part but is thinking why did they do this why do they do this as a normal podcast it doesn't really work as an audio thing well uh, we'll take all feedback gratefully but um and uh, ignore it and ignore it yep. <laughs> that's what you usually do <laughs> no we do try and no actually we usually ignore it don't we you know what we... i think the next time we do this i think we should do it as a sort of standalone thing where everybody who's on that has to come armed with a question and we just randomly pick people um and do, do it that way people came for a relaxing friday evening they didn't want to be <laughs> sort of scared they want to be part of the for the many family that is properly developing and you know without being too soppy about it people are saying nice things about us um genuinely it has helped me and I think it's helped Ian as well to get through uh, the last year to be able to do this and um uh you are such a lovely bunch and um we really appreciate you being willing to hang around with us for two and a half hours on a Friday night yeah, absolutely. And it's been brilliant actually watching you looking at all your different backgrounds. Rory Simpson um, has got a fish tank behind him. Or oh, it's just a Zoom background. I can't quite decide which one it is. Um, uh, the second one. 
Uh, I thought so, probably. And I'm, I'm just going to go through each of the slide, the pages now and pick on one person. Um, Vicky Ward, I'm looking at you now. And with your friend behind you, socially distanced. Um, on the next screen, I'm going to, who am I going to pick here? Uh, Francesco Perola. He's got, I, oh, I'm, I shouldn't have picked you. You've got a terrible picture behind you of the Queen blowing bubble gum. That's outrageous. That's cool. I don't approve of that at all. <laughs> By the way, Jackie, just so you know, um, Politico's is now starting to sell prints of you as pop art. Prints of me? Yeah, I haven't sent it to you yet because they, they only emailed me just before we started. Are they nice? Yeah, because he's making some for the many prints for people. But I will I'll, I will obviously mention that when I haven't actually seen them yet. So I don't know what they're like, but I'm sure they're wonderful. Um, uh, who else am I going to say hello to here? Uh, oh, God, it keeps flicking on different page, screens. I'm, I'm on page four with rather, I'm on page four with page four, boy. Are you? <laughs> Looking gorgeous and silver foxy. I'm looking yeah. at Raman now, who seems to be a bit chilly. She's got a very big blanket all over her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sazzle. Hello, Sazzle. I could get I could do this for the rest of the evening, frankly. <laughs> I love the fact that people are lying down watching us. Yes. <laughs> Is there are, there are there many people in bed? I haven't seen anyone in bed yet. Oh, there's somebody waving. Oh, people Alison, waved at that point. Alison is waving in yes, bed. Yes, Alison's in bed. Annette Hi, Clayton, you can't be in bed. Are, <laughs> You're are in you your in kitchen, bed? Annette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Catherine Stevenson is lying down. Hello. Um, Lorraine is in a hot tub. Are you in a hot no. tub, Lorraine? Yes, Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> We're losing a lot of people now. I think they're bored with this. <laughs> but as I say, I could go on with this for a very, very long time. Steve Gibbons showing showing his pecs there. <laughs> <laughs> and Liam Martin Lane looking very, very happy. I hope you've enjoyed it. Listen, we, we could, I've got to go and have my dinner. Um, otherwise, I will be in trouble. Thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. We've really enjoyed it. Um, it'll be Lovely. on YouTube, on my channel. Uh, sometime tomorrow should you wish to watch any of yourself back why would you i don't know and for Can the we many say a, a massive on. thanks to sean as well yes for, I was yep. just were you coming to that? to that oh you're like a professional go on carry on no, no you carry on um sean as last time has done a flipping brilliant job of setting us up helping to bring the questions forward making sure that we knew what we were doing because you should have heard us being not quite sure in the bit before we started so Sean thank you again for being our our zoom podcast producer you've done a brilliant job absolutely right um so we will bid you farewell and join us again on the next edition of the for the many podcast goodbye <laughs>